Health, Energy and Commerce Subcommittee looks at the FCC's national broadband plan and network neutrality. Yesterday, the House approved an amendment barring the FCC from using any funds to implement the network neutrality order that it passed in December. Network neutrality allows users to pay one price for getting anything off the Internet instead of being charged based on broadband use. From Wednesday, this is just under four hours. Please uh, take your seats and uh, the hearing is about to begin. Everyone to take their seats. Uh, I call to order the uh, Subcommittee on Communications and Technology hearing on net neutrality. I want to welcome our witnesses who are here today. Um, and we look forward to your testimony and the response to our questions. We all want an open and thriving Internet. That Internet exists today. Consumers can access anything they want with the click of a mouse thanks to our historical hands-off approach. Changing direction now will only harm innovation and the economy. But before we even get into the harm the network neutrality rules will cause, it's important to realize the FCC's underlying theory of authority would allow the Commission to regulate any interstate communication service on barely more than a whim and without any additional input from the United States Congress. In essence, the FCC argues it can regulate anything if, in its opinion, doing so would encourage broadband deployment. I am relieved, however, the FCC declined under its newfound authority to regulate coffee shops, bookstores, airlines, and other entities. This, of course, means the FCC believes it has the authority that it has so far declined. It could have uh, subjected these entities to the new rules under its decision. If left unchallenged, this claim of authority would allow the FCC to regulate any matter it discussed in the National Broadband Plan. Recall that the FCC concluded that consumers' concerns over privacy are deterring broadband. Does that mean the FCC can regulate Internet privacy? The National Broadband Plan also addresses health IT, distance learning, smart grids, smart homes, smart transportation. Can the FCC regulate all of these matters, too, in the name of promoting broadband? Under the FCC's rationale, its authority is bounded only by its imagination. Former FCC Chairman Kevin Martin tried to go down a very similar path. In the wake of Hurricane Katrina, he claimed that his authority over wireless services allowed him to require backup power at cell sites. During oral argument, the courts questioned the FCC's logic, asking whether it would grant him seemingly endless authority over things like electric utilities and employees of wireless providers. The FCC eventually backed down. This overreach was problematic with a real disaster like Hurricane Katrina. I don't see how it's justified here. From the Internet's inception, we've taken a hands-off approach. The Internet started as a defense agency project to connect computers to research facilities. It did not become the explosive driver of communications and economic growth. It is today until we turned it over to free enterprise. Dating as far back as 1971, the FCC has consistently treated data services as unregulated information services and not as regulated telecommunications services. Congress codified this distinction in the 1996 Telecommunications Act. FCC Chairman William Kennard reaffirmed this approach. In rebuffing requests to regulate cable Internet access service, Chairman Kennard explained in a 1999 speech, and I quote, that the fertile fields of innovation across the communications sector and around the country are blooming because from the get-go we have taken a deregulatory, competitive approach to our communication structure, especially the Internet, close quote. There is no crisis warranting departure from this approach. The FCC hangs almost its entire case for regulating the Internet on Comcast's past attempt to combat network congestion by managing peer-to-peer -peer traffic. But Comcast and the peer-to-peer -peer community resolved that issue by gathering their engineers and developing alternative solutions that advance traffic management techniques to everyone's benefit. No network neutrality rules were in place, and the D.C. Circuit overturned the FCC's attempts to regulate Comcast network management because the Federal Communications Commission failed to demonstrate it had the authority to do so. Most everything else the order discusses is either an unsubstantiated allegation or speculation of future harm. The FCC even confesses in its order that it's done no market analysis. None. It just selectively applied the rules to broadband providers, shielding web companies. If the mere threat of Internet discrimination is such a concern, and if the FCC has done no analysis to demonstrate why one company has more market power than another, 
Why would discrimination by companies like Google or Skype be any more acceptable than discrimination by companies like AT&T and Comcast? Instead of promoting competition, such picking of winners and losers will stifle the investment needed to perpetuate the Internet's phenomenal growth, hurting the economy. Section 230 of the Communications Act makes it the policy of the United States to, quote, preserve the vibrant and competitive free market that presently exists for the Internet and other interactive computer services unfettered by federal or state regulation. Statutory statements of policy are not grants of regulatory authority but they can help delineate the contours of that authority. In light of Congress's statutory pronouncement that Internet regulation is disfavored, the FCC's theory of regulation by bank shot stretches too far. At bottom, this is little more than an end run around the D.C. Circuit April 2010 ruling in the Comcast case that the FCC failed to show it had the ancillary authority to regulate network management. With that, I now turn to uh, the ranking member for her opening statement. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, and a uh, warm welcome uh, to all of the commissioners of the uh, Federal Communications Commission. It's very good to see you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chairman Walden for calling the commissioners before us early uh, in this Congress. It's vitally important that we hear from the full commission to help uh, members make informed decisions on the key telecommunications uh, issues that will before, uh, be before us in this Congress. Uh, today's hearing is intended to examine the FCC's action to preserve an open Internet and a proposed mechanism to unravel these rules. Since being elected to the House in 1992, I've witnessed my district lead a technology revolution and the nation has prospered as has the world. This success has come in large part due to the Internet's growth, an open forum where companies compete online and consumers have a choice in the content they consume. In only a few years, innovative companies like Netflix, Skype, and eBay have flourished. These companies have created tens of thousands of jobs and new competition in areas like telephone service, video, and online shopping, not just in my district, but across the nation. By one estimate, the open Internet ecosystem has resulted in more than 3 million new jobs, U.S. jobs, over the past 15 years. To promote the next Google or Facebook, we must preserve these essential qualities and ensure that the Internet remains open and free. While the FCC's open Internet rules are not perfect, they're an important step forward. Without some clear rules of the road, large corporations can carve up the Internet into fast and slow lanes, charging a toll for content and blocking innovators from entering the information superhighway. I believe consumers, not corporations, should be in the driver's seat to pick the content they view, listen, and watch over the Internet. We're now faced with at least two legal challenges in the use of legislative maneuvers like the Congressional Review Act to overturn the FCC's work. These actions will inevitably create market uncertainty. And I want to repeat that, Mr. Chairman. These actions will inevitably create market uncertainty and delay future innovation in broadband technology. Each member of this subcommittee has made it clear where they stand on the issue. And I don't expect this uh, hearing to change those views. What's important to remember is what the FCC agreed to is a compromise a word that um, a lot of Americans uh, celebrate. They understand that compromises have to be made, reflecting the views of both sides of the issue with more than 100,000 comments from more than 2 million people across the country, 90% of whom were in favor of open Internet rules. So the American people have really weighed in with the FCC. There's a broad agreement for the adoption of these rules. Comcast, the nation's largest broadband provider, voluntarily agreed to abide by open Internet conditions for the next seven years as part of its joint venture with NBC Universal. AT&T has said it will not engage in efforts to overturn the FCC's order. If these common sense rules are good enough for the nation's two largest broadband providers, then I think it's time we focus 
or refocus on efforts on the next steps needed to promote jobs, broadband deployment, and new investment. I think it's time to look forward. It's really what America is about and on what we can work on together in a bipartisan way. We're faced with important issues like universal service reform, spectrum reform, and ensuring that our country's first responders have a nationwide interoperable public safety network. We will be coming up to the uh, 10th anniversary of the attack on our country, and we still do not have interoperability with our public safety community. That's what this Congress, this committee, and full committee should be tackling. And when we tackle these issues, we'll have an opportunity to create jobs in our country, grow our economy, and a platform we can all agree on. I look forward to hearing from the distinguished chairman of the commission, all the distinguished commissioners, and their thoughts on how we can ensure that the Internet remains a vital resource, an American resource, to improve the lives of uh, every citizen and everyone around the world for generations to come. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank the gentlelady for her comments. I'd now yield two minutes to the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The FCC's recent adoption of network neutrality rules to regulate the Internet is perhaps the most striking example of a troubling trend that we have seen at this very important agency. Rather than serving as an impartial expert and authority, the Commission seems to be advancing a policy agenda of its own, often by twisting the arms of those who have come before it. The activist agenda is particularly embodied in the network neutrality regulations that are subject of today's hearing. We are pleased to see Chairman Janikowski uh, today alongside of his fellow commissioners uh, and uh, who announced plans in September of 2009 to codify four network neutrality principles as enforceable rules. However, the, the history of these principles is clear. First put forward in 2004, they were intended for all facets of the industry in lieu of regulations. Even when adopted as policies in 05, the FCC made clear that they were not established as rules, nor were they enforceable. The decision came only three months after taking the helm of the FCC, despite the fact that he made no intention, no mention of those plans four days earlier during the, his first appearance before this committee. I've made it clear that the Energy and Commerce Committee would be focused on jobs. And as we have seen in the first couple of weeks of the 112th Congress, one of the greatest threats to job creation in our current economy is runaway regulation. Regulations are not the problem in and of themselves. In fact, it is regulations that implement the laws passed by Congress. The problem comes when unelected personnel in the maze of the federal bureaucracy begin using the regulations to impose their own agendas, and when they do so without congressional authority or thoughtful consideration of the economic consequences. Net neutrality is a case in point. You know, the FCC has done nothing to specifically quantify any harm requiring intervention or the potential harm to consumers, innovation, or the economy from the proposed rules. Where is the cost-benefit analysis that President Obama called for in his recent executive order? This hearing is uh, to look into that, and I look forward to the answers uh, of those uh, that are here, and I, I uh, ask that the rest of my statement be included as part of the record. Uh, without, uh, without objection, and, and now I think we go to Mr. Barton for a minute on our side. <laughs> we, we have a little high-tech problem getting the button on over here. This went off again. Welcome our uh, four commissioners and chairman of the FCC. Uh, you're all great individuals. You're all very bright. I disagree with the majority of you on your net neutrality regulations that you put in place, but uh, I'm impressed by your intellect. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll put my statement in the record. Suffice it to say that um, I do not see how this commission, uh, with the intelligence that they have, could have adopted the rule they did on a three to two partisan vote, knowing that um, there was probably going to be, in fact, knowing there had been a change in the Congress, and that every candidate who ran on the net neutrality principle that they tried to establish was defeated, and knowing that the majority of this committee and the majority of the Congress on both sides of the aisle opposed the uh, rule that they've now put in place. Uh, we have two hearings going on simultaneously, so uh, Mr. Upton and myself and others will be going up and down and back, but uh, 
I hope to come back in time to question the, uh, uh, the Commission uh, and try to delve into why they did what they did when they did it, knowing that um, uh, it was not going to be well received. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I now yield uh, a minute to the gentleman from Nebraska, the Vice Chair of the Committee, Mr. Terry. Thank you, Mr. Walden. I uh, believe it is safe to say that everyone in this room today wants an open and thriving Internet. It is therefore important to point out that such an Internet exists today. It is no coincidence that today's Internet users can access anything they want very quickly and easily. This was made possible due to our historical hands-off approach to the Internet. As users demand more sophisticated content, service, and applications, we must maintain a similar course or face the inevitable decline in investment, service, and overall blow to our economy. I am worried that the FCC's adoption of its network neutrality rules regulating the Internet will do just that, and I am further concerned that, we, uh, that they were adopted strictly on the specul uh, speculation of future harm. On October 5, 2009, my colleagues and I sent a letter asking that the Commission undertake a full market analysis prior to any consideration of network neutrality rules. It is made clear in the order that no such analysis took place. Instead, the order selectively applies the rules to broadband providers while shielding web-based companies. I am interested in learning today why the Commission, instead of promoting competition, decided it was more appropriate to pick the winners and the losers. If there were a mere threat of Internet discrimination is such a concern and the FCC has done no analysis to demonstrate why one company has more market power than another, why would discrimination by companies like Google or Skype be any more acceptable than discrimination by companies like Verizon and Cox? Hopefully these questions will be answered today. I plan on seeking the answers to these questions and about impact on the market. And I yield back. Uh, we now recognize uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts, uh, Mr. Markey, for a minute. Thank you. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to, I want to speak on behalf of those of us who ran on net neutrality who are still in Congress, which starts with Ms. Eshoo, through Mr. Waxman, through Mr. Markey, through Ms. Doyle, Ms. Matsui, all the way down, just so the record is clear that uh, we are here as we have been. And I also want to uh, point out that um, AT&T was offered the contract to build the Internet in 1966 and they turned it down because they said they had a monopoly already in long lines and they did not want to build a packet switch network. So they had to go to BB&N, a small company up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, to build the Internet. AT&T didn't want it. In 1996, after we passed the Telecom Act, um, Verizon sued saying, uh, we don't want to open up our network under that law to competitors. Um, and the story goes on and on that the broadband barons, uh, anytime they have control of something, they don't want competition. But this Internet revolution that created Google and eBay and Amazon and uh, YouTube and Hulu and all of the rest of these companies, it's all as a result not of the policy of Verizon, the policy of, of these other tele large companies, it is that the government acted. So here is the interesting thing. The paradox of competition is that it takes regulations in order to create deregulation, in order to create a marketplace where smaller entrepreneurial uh, companies can get into the marketplace. That is what has happened over the last 30 years. The government has acted in order to make sure that a company that had already invented broadband, already invented digital, that is AT&T, but had not deployed it. So we were all still using black rotary dial phones 100 years after Alexander Graham Bell in our living room. You don't go from black rotary dial phones to black berries unless the government finally intervenes and says, we want these entrepreneurs, we want these smart new companies uh, that are entering into the marketplace. That is what has happened over this last generation. That is what this debate is all about. I wish the FCC had gone further so that we could have hundreds, thousands of newer companies coming in and not just relying upon Verizon uh, to innovate because that will be a long day before you hear about the first new product that comes from Verizon. That has never happened and it is unlikely to ever happen in your lifetimes. I yield back, Mr. Chairman.
There's Mr. Waxman. We're, we're waiting for the Chairman Emeritus. So Mr. Waxman, you have the remaining two minutes and 35 seconds once you're comfortably seated and ready to go. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I regret that this committee has another subcommittee meeting at the same time. I'm pleased you have this hearing today. This is the first FCC-related hearing of the subcommittee. I think it's appropriate that our witnesses are the five members of the commission. Uh, last uh, December, the FCC took landmark action to preserve the open Internet. These rules are a Bill of Rights from Internet for Internet users. They can contain four key provisions restore FCC's authority to prevent blocking of Internet content applications and services, which was struck down by the court in the Comcast decision, prevent phone and cable companies from unreasonably discriminating against any lawful Internet traffic, prohibit wireless broadband providers from blocking websites as well as applications that compete with voice or video conferencing while preserving FCC's authority to adopt additional standards and safeguards under existing authorities and the directly FCC to issue transparency regulations so consumers know the price, performance, and network management practices. Uh, I, we're going to hear about uh, these uh, regulations to protect the open Internet, and I think that we have to recognize that some of the claims that are being made and repeated over and over again are just not accurate. The most vibrant sector of our economy today is our Internet economy. U.S. companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, and eBay lead the world in innovation. They all urged the FCC to act to protect an open Internet because, I quote, common sense baseline rules are critical to ensuring that the Internet remains a key engine of economic growth, innovation, and global competitiveness. We need to uh, uh, make sure that the Internet is uh, free and open and not regulated by uh, anyone uh, who is uh, just simply delivering the service. Even AT&T and Comcast, which are two of the nation's largest network operators, support the rules. AT&T CEO stated, we didn't get everything we wanted. I wanted no regulation, but we ended at a place where we have a line of sight and we know we can commit to investments, end quote. And earlier today, we received letters from a broad and diverse coalition of more than 100 organizations that oppose efforts to use legislation to block the open Internet regulations. The American people want us to be focusing on creating jobs, rebuilding our economy. We have important opportunities in this subcommittee to contribute to that effort by making more spectrum available, ensuring universal access to broadband. We have a lot of things we need to work on together, and uh, I look forward to that. This issue has been uh, resolved by the FCC, and uh, I look forward to our following the implementation of it. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put in the full statement. Yeah, without objection, all members are allowed the opportunity to put their full statements in the record. Uh, with that, I thank uh, the folks who have offered up uh, the uh, opening statements, and I would now like to turn to our panel of witnesses, the uh, distinguished members of the Federal Communications Commission, and I'll start with uh, that Commission's Chairman, Mr. Janikowski. Thank you for being here today, and we look forward to your uh, statement. Are we on now? Same high tech problem. We can hear you now. <laughs> Chairman Walden, uh, Chairman Upton, Ranking Member Eshoo and Waxman, uh, members of the subcommittee. This committee has jurisdiction over an area of increasing importance, communications and technology, including the internet. I look forward to working with this committee on a variety of ways to strengthen our economy, promote our global competitiveness, and extend opportunity to all Americans. I've submitted a written statement on our actions to preserve internet freedom and openness, so I'll be brief here. As we considered a framework for internet freedom, I had three priorities. First, consumers. Promoting consumer choice. Making sure that people who use the internet have the freedom to say what they want, go where they want, and access any legal content or services on the internet. Second, innovators, making sure that the, con that the internet will continue to be a vibrant platform for American entrepreneurs, that the next inventor in his garage, the next Mark Zuckerberg in his dorm room, the next Jeff Bezos traveling across the country in his car, 
can start and build the next great business on the Internet, creating jobs, growing our economy, and helping us lead the world in innovation. It's essential that we incentivize billions of dollars of private investment in Internet content, applications, and services businesses. Now, my third priority is the networks, promoting wired and wireless Internet networks in the U.S. that are the best in the world, fast, robust, and universally available. We have to incentivize, bill to incentivize billions of dollars of private investment to the core of the network, to network of online applications and services have spurred broadband deployment and adoption, which in turn have encouraged new applications and services. This virtuous cycle of innovation and investment throughout the broadband economy, that's what we want to maintain and advance. Why? Because the free and open internet has led to the creation of tens of thousands of small businesses, millions of jobs, and billions of dollars of investment. Now, since 2005, the FCC, on a bipartisan basis, has made clear it would act to enforce open Internet protections. It did so several times, but it did so without an appropriately adopted framework. That's why we acted to bring some resolution and certainty to this area. And after an open and participatory process with published rules, public workshops, extensive engagement, feedback from over 200,000 commenters, we established a sensible, high-level framework to preserve Internet freedom and openness. The rules fit on one page and boil down to four things. First, transparency, so that consumers and innovators can have basic information to make smart choices about broadband networks or how to develop and launch the next killer app. Empowering them with, with information will reduce the need for government involvement. Second, no blocking, so that consumers can be free to access lawful content or services, and so startup and other Internet companies can be free to reach Internet consumers. Third, a level playing field, a fair non-discrimination principle so that winners and losers online are picked by who should pick them, consumers, and the market. And fourth, flexibility for internet service providers. Flexibility to manage networks, to deal with congestion or harmful traffic. Flexibility to pursue innovation and business models and get a real return on investment. Now, I understand that some people think this framework doesn't go far enough. Others think it goes too far. I believe it gets it about right a light-touch approach consistent with the FCC's history of bipartisan action on this issue, informed by earlier FCC and congressional initiatives, supported by the broadest consensus ever assembled on this challenging topic, the framework we adopted preserves Internet freedom, preserves the Internet job creation engine, protects consumer choice, and promotes private investment throughout the broadband economy. Now, while the Commission was divided on this particular issue. Uh, we resolve over 95 percent of our votes on a bipartisan basis, and I believe we're united on the need to promote broadband access, its importance to our 21st century economy and our global competitiveness, and to expanding opportunity broadly. So I look forward to working with my colleagues and with the committee on a series of initiatives, including unleashing spectrum, reforming universal service, removing barriers to broadband build-out, to harness the opportunities of communications technologies for all Americans. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Chairman, thank you for your testimony. We look forward to your answers. Um, uh, now recognize the uh, distinguished gentleman, the Commissioner, Mr. Copps. We're delighted to have you here this morning. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Chairman Walden and Chairman Upton and Ranking Member Eshoo and Ranking Member Waxman and all the friends on the uh, committee. I appreciate your invitation to participate in this discussion to share with you my perspectives and, more importantly, to hear yours. I look forward to your counsel as, what we, as we begin what I think can be a truly productive year in tackling many telecommunications challenges facing Congress, uh, the Commission, and, and the country. Uh, uh, it's my firm belief, first of all, that broadband is key to America's 21st century prosperity. The President, 
The Congress and the Commission are all looking to this communications infrastructure as a key tool for ensuring a better and brighter future for America. There is much work to be done to ensure that everyone in this country has equal opportunity in the digital age. I believe that preserving a free and open Internet, the focus of today's hearing, is a central part of that challenge. I know there are disagreements among us about the issue, but I have always been open and candid with you before the subcommittee and in your personal offices on where I stand. And I believe I have been consistent in what I say both here and at the FCC. Most Americans have a broadband monopoly or at best duopoly from which to choose. Without adequate competition in the Internet access service market, allowing these companies to exercise unfettered control over America's access to the Internet not only creates risk to technological innovation and economic growth, but also poses a real threat to freedom of speech and the future of our democracy. This is why I have long advocated for some limited rules of the road to maintain openness and freedom on the Internet. It is why the Commission adopted in 2005, on a bipartisan basis, an Internet policy statement that contained the basic rights of Internet consumers. This is not about government regulating the Internet. It is about ensuring consumers, rather than big telephone or big cable, have maximum control over their experiences when they go online. During the FCC's proceeding to examine the need for open Internet rules, I swung my door open wide so I could hear from every interested stakeholder. I met with broadband providers, online entrepreneurs, technology investors, consumer groups, and many individual citizens from across the country. In the end, given that fewer and fewer players are controlling access to the Internet, I concluded again that we must make sure a few gatekeepers cannot favor their own content, throttle certain types of applications, and block access to information at will. With the adoption of the Open Internet Order last December, we have at least some concrete rules to prevent gatekeepers from circumventing the openness that made the Internet the Internet. The Commission has acted using the authority I believe it has and that I lay out at greater length in my formal statement and now both Congress and the courts will help determine where we go from here. While we may not always agree on how to proceed on every policy front, there are so many challenges confronting us where you and I share common cause and where I think we can make real progress this year. First and foremost among them is ensuring that our first responders have the communications tools they need to protect American lives and property. We are fast approaching the 10th anniversary year of 9-11, I believe we must make good on our promise to create a nationwide interoperable public safety network and make progress in significant and tangible ways this year. Another area crying out for attention is spectrum policy. As consumers expect ever faster speeds and mobility for their broadband, the demand on our finite spectrum resource skyrockets. Just last week, the President set an ambitious goal of getting high-speed wireless coverage to 98 percent of Americans. This is another area where we can work hand-in-hand -hand to find ways to maximize our spectrum resource. In addition to meet, help meet our shared broadband goals, the Commission took an important step last week toward transforming the Universal Service Fund and intercarrier compensation systems to address our going forward communications infrastructure needs. There are other challenges, privacy, digital literacy, to name a few, where I believe we can work together to ensure that our citizens have the tools they need for our increasingly online world. In addition, while I will not dwell on it here, I think most members of this subcommittee know of my concerns about America's current media environment, and this goes to the question of broadband and online too. A vibrant media landscape, traditional and online, is critical to providing our citizens with the news and information they need to participate in our democracy. There are some huge problems here. Finally, as I do every time I come up here, I urge you to take action to modify the closed meeting rule, which prohibits more than two commissioners from ever talking with one another at the same time outside of a public meeting. I believe this prohibition has on many occasions during my 10 years at the Commission stifled collaborative discussions among colleagues, delayed timely decision making, and discouraged collegiality. Removal of this prohibition would, in my mind, constitute as major a reform of Commission procedures as anything I can contemplate. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. I look forward to your comments, your counsel, and your questions. 
Thank you, Commissioner, and that's why we have you all here, so that you can all get along and chat. Um, <laughs> it's a good thing. I'd now like to, uh, and, and we've never questioned, Commissioner Copps, uh, your, your forthright approach to uh, telling us your opinions either, nor is yeah. anyone in America, and we appreciate that. Um, I'd like to go now to the Commissioner, uh, Mr. McDowell. Thank you for being here. We welcome your comments and testimony as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Eshoo and Chairman Upton and Ranking Member uh, Waxman. And I also want to give a special shout out to Congresswoman Harmon. This is a sad day for uh, me. Uh, this is the last time uh, all of us uh, will testify before you. I want to thank you for your years of public service. It's a sad day for the McDowell household. I know my brother Kelly, the former mayor of El Segundo, California, is sad to have you leave the U.S. Congress. But I know the Woodrow Wilson Center will be in excellent hands with you at the helm. So thank you for your service. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, the markets under the purview of the FCC are dynamic and ever-evolving. Both the core and the edge of the Internet are growing at breakneck speeds, all to the benefit of American consumers. For instance, the U.S. leads the world in 4G wireless deployment and adoption. Wireless broadband is the fastest growing segment of the American broadband market. The U.S. is also the global leader in the creation and use of mobile apps. In fact, the top 300 free mobile applications in uh, the U.S. app stores enjoyed an average of more than 300 million downloads per day last December, and I think most of those were on McDowell Kids' phones, actually. Not surprisingly, smartphone sales have outpaced PCs for the first time. On the other hand, in spite of these positive developments, last year the private sector invested an estimated $44 billion in new broadband technologies, which is significantly lower than in years past. I'm hopeful that the FCC can work constructively to increase opportunities for investment and job growth by bringing regulatory certainty to the broadband marketplace. With Congress's guidance, I look forward to adopting policies that put the power of more spectrum into the hands of consumers, help accelerate broadband deployment and adoption, make our universal service subsidy program more efficient, and modernize our media ownership rules, among many, many other endeavors. In addition, the FCC should also strive to clear away regulatory underbrush that may have outlived its usefulness and now only deters constructive risk taking. Congress empowered the Commission to do just that when it codified Section 10's forbearance mandate more than 15 years ago. Streamlining our regulations could take significant burdens off the backs of entrepreneurs and give them more freedom to invest and innovate. Such deregulatory action could serve as a much needed shot in the arm for America's economy. President Obama said as much in his recent executive order. And a little secret about the FCC, which the chairman has already touched on, more than 90 percent of our votes are not only bipartisan, but are unanimous. I have enjoyed working with my colleagues on many recent initiatives, including continuation of our longstanding work on unlicensed use of the TV white spaces, simplifying the process for the construction of cell towers, spectrum reallocation, and initiating the next step to reform our universal service subsidy system. Obviously, we've had a few respectful disagreements as well, such as our differences concerning the new regulations of Internet network management. And I've included, a, for your convenience, a copy of my dissent. Nonetheless, I'm confident that the five of us have the ability and the desire to continue to find common ground on an array of other issues that touch the lives of every American every day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to the questions from the committee. We appreciate your testimony. Now I'd like to go to the distinguished member of the Commission, Ms. Clyburn. Thank you for being with us today. We look forward to your comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Congresswoman Eshoo, members of the subcommittee. Good morning and thank you for inviting me to testify. The current success of the Internet is largely due to its open architecture. This tremendous technological leap is a great equalizer. It allows traditionally underrepresented groups to have an equal voice and equal opportunity. It enables any connected individual to distribute his or her ideas to a global network or run a business right from their very own home. The Internet reduces the barriers to entry for new players. It is a gateway to success at a low capital cost. That is why it is so important for me to see that this technological marvel remains open, accessible, and affordable for every American regardless of where they live, work, or play. There have been strong criticisms over the past several months regarding the Commission's open Internet order. Some say that nothing was broken, so rules aren't needed. 
and that this will kill job opportunities and stifle innovation and investment. We have also heard that the order is riddled with loopholes, provides inadequate protections for wireless technologies, and prioritizes profits over the general public good. First, I want to speak to the assertion that the internet marketplace is functioning fine and does not need fixing. There have been formal complaints filed and allegations lodged at the Commission about internet service providers' behavior despite their expressed belief in an open internet. To that point, the rules we codified in December will serve to ensure that the internet remains open and vibrant and that millions of surfers, innovators, and everyday consumers will have the essential protections they need so that an open internet is still there tomorrow. The action we took in December will allow people to view photos, sitcoms, and full-length movies without deliberate interruption, distortion, or blockage by any ISP which may have competing economic interests. I believe one of my primary obligations as an FCC commissioner is to protect consumers and the lawful activities on the internet. Our open internet order does just that. I embrace the position that without clear rules, investment in new services and applications will be uncertain, overly cautious, and will result in an underperforming marketplace. We have heard this repeatedly from innovators and small businesses. A number of companies told me of their difficulty, sometimes inability, to obtain financing because the rules of the road were unclear or that open internet protections were inadequate. Venture capitalists fear that ISPs would discriminate against their possible competitors, they said. Small businesses like these are the lifeblood of this nation, and the uncertainty and lack of investment in this sector will stifle the full potential of these American enterprises. Others argue that existing law provides sufficient consumer protections and safeguards. I disagree. My understanding of current antitrust law is that violations and harms are addressed only after an incident has occurred, thus ISPs have the ability and potentially the incentive to stifle new competitive businesses. No government action after the fact could properly address such significant impact. Therefore, I believe that putting basic protections in place was not a reckless act. The Commission did this in order to prevent very real and irreversible harms that could occur in the marketplace. Hugely effective business models that were not even in existence 10 years ago have experienced staggering growth due to their ability to directly offer their services to consumers on the Internet without ISPs demanding payment for prioritizing their websites. I want to ensure that many more businesses have those same opportunities in 2021. Most people rely on the internet on a regular basis, as indicated in a recent Pew Research Center study, which shows that 78% of American adults sign on daily. The president has said that the internet is a vital infrastructure and has become central to the daily economic life of almost every American. And you recognize its significance too. By charging the FCC with developing a national broadband plan to ensure that high-speed internet is available to all Americans, no matter where they live. So I do not think we acted recklessly, nor, I, nor do I believe that we have harmed the internet. What we did was put a policy in place that will ensure access to lawful websites, applications, and services so that consumers, not their internet service providers, can choose which companies, products, services, and ideas will succeed. Thank you for this opportunity this morning, and I look forward to answering any of your questions. And we appreciate your testimony. Look forward to your answers. And now I'd like to recognize the uh, Commissioner Baker, we're delighted to have you here as well. We look forward to your testimony and uh, your answers. Please go ahead. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Good morning, Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo, Chairman Upton, and Ranking Member Waxman. I could go on. Thank you all distinguished members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to appear before you. Today, 95% of U.S. households have access to broadband, and the vast majority of those households have broadband choice. 
Our regulatory approach has attracted over half a trillion dollars to build a new network infrastructure since 2000. Billions more have been invested in devices and applications that ride on those networks. This is an area of our economy that is clearly working. The Commission's most significant challenge is how to build on this success. Given our nation's significant budgetary constraints, it is clear that the next generation of networks will be constructed primarily by private capital, just as today's networks were built. It is through this prism, how do we craft policies to promote greater investment in our nation's infrastructure that I view all FCC decisions. With that perspective, I believe that net neutrality was both the wrong policy and the wrong priority. Further, establishing a nationwide policy is Congress's role, not the FCC's. We exceeded our statutory authority. Preserving the open internet is non-negotiable. It is a bedrock principle shared by all in the internet economy. The internet is open today without the need for affirmative government regulation. Lacking an evidentiary record of industry-wide abuses, the Commission's net neutrality decision was based on speculative harms. The word could alone appears over 60 times. By acting in anticipation of hypothetical harms, the result is overly broad rules, which I fear will force the government into too prominent a role in shaping tomorrow's internet. The genius of the internet is that there is no central command to dictate how innovation is to occur. The commission has now inserted itself into that role of judging how the internet will evolve. Government will be hard pressed to manage the next generation of the internet as well as competition and consumer demand have done for previous generations. This risk is heightened because the internet and our broadband networks are still very much in their infancy. The internet will increase fourfold by 2014 and mobile broadband will more than double each and every year. To respond to the consumer demands for faster and more robust broadband services, operators will have to invest billions more in their infrastructure. They will need to experiment and innovate to serve consumers. Decisions about the future of the internet will now be managed by the commission, subject to the uncertainty of government sanction and delay of government decision making. The open-ended nature of this decision, both in how it was legally justified and in the number of issues left undefined or undecided, will only breed greater regulatory uncertainty, which necessarily raises the ca cost of capital. In too many ways, this decision was a first step, not a last. Congress has given the Commission clear statutorily mandated responsibilities, and net neutrality is not one of those. Lacking explicit authority, the Commission twisted the statute in order to establish a national Internet policy. Under the same unbounded claim of legal authority, the FCC could adopt any policies it desires to promote its particular vision of the Internet. Net neutrality was also the wrong priority for the Commission. The focus on net neutrality diverted resources away from the bipartisan reform efforts that could have directly addressed the core challenge of promoting broadband deployment. This lost opportunity is one of the gravest consequences of the net neutrality debate. While we may disagree on particular details, I welcome the Chairman's renewed focus on universal service, spectrum, and broadband infrastructure. All of these reforms are directly linked to broadband deployment. And I only regret that we did not place a higher priority on these efforts sooner. Our ability to successfully take any of these steps is dependent upon our strong working relationship with Congress to ensure that we prioritize and target our efforts appropriately and that we have sufficient statutory authority to move forward to promote our shared goals. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony and all of those, uh, your testimony by all the commissioners and the chairman. We appreciate it. Just for the committee, uh, as an announcement, we're going to try and do two rounds, at least, of questions. And we will go in the order in which you arrived and then by seniority after the gavel fell. Um, and I want to just point out that uh, in the great spirit of bipartisanship here on the subcommittee, the Democrats actually have three witnesses and we only have two. Um, <laughs> Try not to let we're looking that. to change it after 2012. Yeah, yeah, we're, <laughs> we'll, we'll try not to let that happen again. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll start with the uh, first question. So, Commissioner McDowell, uh, you said in, on page 154 of, of your dissent that less than a year ago the Commission, in attempting to defend its Comcast bit torrent decision in the D.C. Circuit, quote, acknowledged that it has no express authority over an Internet service provider's network management practices. Um, they rely on, on, on Section 706 to authorize 
the FCC in this order to adopt network neutrality rules. Section 706 also states that, quote, each State Commission, and uh, Commissioner Clyburn, you will be interested in this, with regulatory jurisdiction over telecommunications services shall encourage the deployment on a reasonable and timely basis of advanced telecommunications capabilities to all Americans, close quote. If the FCC is relying on Section 706 and perhaps uh, B, not A, but you do trigger the entire statute, I believe, does not, not mean that every State regulatory commission as authorized in 706A can also adopt its own network neutrality rules, including price caps as specified in that statute? You know, it could, absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one of the concerns is that in the FCC's order there is no limiting principle on the FCC's authority. So uh, that is not uh, defined or limited in the FCC order. Mr. Clyburn, in, in early January, just a few weeks after the Commission's opening, open meeting, a complaint was already filed alleging that a wireless provider offering a low-cost data plan to informed customers is violating the Commission's rules. The rules still have not taken effect. So the question is, is Metro PCS's low-cost data plan a violation of the Commission's order? Uh, those uh, type of the complaints generally that come before the Commission, I, I generally uh, do not uh, comment um, on before this decision is uh, rendered. Uh, so I, I don't know if you have a, a, a follow-up. So that particular one I, I, I'm not comfortable in uh, commenting on. Well, I, I guess the question is not specific. Let me, let me back off then. Would a, a complaint like that violate uh, the Commission's rules in general? Uh, I, I can say that um, in, in general, to um, answer your question uh, more broadly, uh, in fact, there have been uh, complaints uh, before uh, the agency, and, and that is why uh, the uh, chair and the um, commissioners voted to move in this particular direction it's in order to uh, be able to have the dexterity to address those particular issues and right. as proof that there, is, there are some issues in the market. Uh, Commissioner Baker, the order argues that it can regulate cable Internet access because broadcasters are increasingly providing video over the Internet. Does that mean then, taken to an extreme, that the FCC could regulate Netflix since broadcasters are increasingly offering shows on DVD or Netflix web service? Well, I think that's the current, uh, that's the concern with the statutory authority the Commission is using for this order and that we have unbridled we have unbridled access to regulate whatever we want to do in the Internet ecosystem. Um, it's also been widely reported, Commissioner Baker, that uh, you and Commissioner McDowell did not receive the final draft of the order until close to midnight the day before the vote. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Um, Commissioner McDowell, do you want to speak to that at all? Uh, that's, that's true. We would received other drafts prior to that, but the final draft that we were to vote on and, and uh, base our dissent on didn't come until close to midnight the night before the meeting. That's true. And Commissioner McDowell, while the order does not explicitly, explicitly apply Title II to broadband Internet access services, aren't the rules that were imposed tantamount to common carriage? Mr. Chairman, as I point out in my dissent, I think uh, the rules are really uh, title two, it's a Title II order uh, in disguise. Uh, there's sort of a threadbare Title I disguise, and that's uh, Part of the concern uh, you were asking uh, Commissioner Clyburn about the potential for rate regulation. Um, you know, last year, uh, last January, when uh, the SEC argued before the D.C. Circuit in the Comcast BitTorrent case, the, the General Counsel, and this is cited in the, in the D.C. Circuit's order from last April, uh, the General Counsel uh, said there, that the Commission could have the authority to regulate broadband rates as well. And there's no limiting principle in the order that would. Uh, restrain the Commission from regulating and I, and I think that's a concern some of us have, is this, this box has been opened pretty widely. The tether seems to have been snapped, and the authority could be taken clear to the extreme of where the states now under Section 706A, if, if it's read that way, it could trigger that statute, and the states could enter into regulation of the Internet. Now, Commissioner McDowell, if the FCC has conducted no market analysis, which it says it has not, is there any principled reason for excluding companies like Google and Skype from these rules? Again, there's no limiting principle in the order. So I think uh, under the logic of the order, the FCC's jurisdiction is boundless. And after all, Skype blocks access to competing application providers like Fring, right? 
I mean, you have a blockage going there, and Google and Facebook have had some blocking issues involving consumer access to their own contacts. My, my time's expired. With that, I would recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Eshu. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to uh, each of the commissioner, commissioners for your uh, excellent um, uh, opening statements. Uh, today's hearing um, is entitled um, Network Neutrality and Internet Regulation warranted or more economic harm than good. Um, the three basic rules that the chairman uh, rolled out, which are the, uh, the, is the framework uh, for what the commission did, transparency, no blocking, no unreasonable discrimination. I don't think anyone is against transparency for blocking and uh, for uh, unreasonable discrimination. Um, if you are, raise your hand on the, on the subcommittee. Uh, but I want to examine the issue of harm uh, and what led to the framework uh, that the commissioner state, that the chairman stated uh, and which I just restated. Um, uh, what were the harmful things that have arisen at the FCC that led to uh, rules of the road. I mean, the Republicans are saying the sky's caving in. Uh, uh, really, life is tidy. No one has crossed any lines. There isn't any reason to do this. In fact, uh, it's really going to hurt our country. Uh, but uh, I want to give you the opportunity uh, to state as briefly as you can uh, what, um, uh, uh, what led to this and what examples uh, exist uh, um, and, and we're brought to the com com uh, commissioners, uh, the commission's attention. Thank you. Well, going back to at least 2005, the commission made clear on a bipartisan basis that it would enforce open internet violations. Against that background, it's surprising that there would be any violations of internet freedom at all. But there have been. Uh, there was a telephone company called Madison River that blocked access to competing voice over internet providers. There was a cable company last year became significant litigation that blocked competing video provider. Uh, last year, there was a mobile company that blocked access to mobile VoIP. There have been court settlements that are part of the record, whereas part of the settlements, uh, internet service providers agree that they engaged in conduct that was inconsistent with uh, open internet principles. So as against the, uh, the, the history of bipartisan uh, uh, intention and, uh, uh, to enforce, it's surprising there, weren't, uh, there were any violations at all. The harm, one of the harms that we looked at was if we were, the, for the first time, would be to remove basic open internet protections. What we heard repeatedly from startup companies, entrepreneurs, investors, was that without that, they would lose the confidence to invest in startup companies uh, to develop the kind of innovative products and services and applications that we're all so excited about and that we need to lead the world in innovation in the 21st century. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a question for each one of the commissioners, and a yes or no will do. Uh, the re uh, Republican House leaders and uh, 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 members of this committee are considering uh, using a resolution of disapproval under the uh, CRA, the Congressional Review Act, uh, to overturn the FCC's uh, open internet order. Uh, do you support or oppose uh, Congress using the uh, CRA to overturn the order? Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman Janikowski? Uh, well, I don't have a, a, a vote in uh, Congress. I don't think it's the right idea because I think it will increase uh, so uh, uncertainty no. in this area. Commissioner Cops? Uh, I would not be supporting. Commissioner McDowell? First of all, all the examples cited by uh, Chairman Janikowski um, were resolved in favor of consumers under existing law before the FCC's action. I think that's important to note. But I also subscribe to the fact, the, the notion that Congress tells me what to do. I don't tell Congress what to do. So if Congress so wants to overturn an FCC order under the CRA, but do you think I it's a good idea? That. Do you support? Well, it? obviously, I dissented. Uh, so I think uh, the order isn't founded in law or fact. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Clyburn. Sorry, technical difficulties. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I wanted to point out, and I, if you will allow me a second, is that the companies that were cited uh, by the chairman, those companies, in fact, have millions of customers who um, have pot potential vulnerabilities and who might not have the ability uh, or the uh, expertise to, uh, to complain or com have a form of complaint. Uh, so in, t in terms of your, your question, um, while I respect the body, um, I 
am not embracing of the idea. Thank you. Commissioner Baker. Um, I'll be respectful of your time. We take, our, uh, we take our orders from Congress, so I think it's important for Congress to tell us what their opinion is. I don't know what that means. Uh, it means if Congress, if Congress has, but do you think Congress it's a good idea? The CRA to tell us that they disapprove of this action. Do you I think, think that a CRA us. is a good idea? I, I, I would say I also dissented from the order. I disagree with that. We have statutory authority to ha, to do what we've done. The gentlelady's time <coughs> has expired. Thank you. Uh, and just for the record, Ms. Clyburn, we. Uh, it was, we have two chairmen here. I assume you were referring to that chairman, not this chairman, in your comments there. Yeah. So now let's go to the other chairman, uh, <laughs> Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know it was George Will who said uh, not too long ago that most folks, uh, most Americans uh, are not real, real uh, fans of how the U.S. government works. I don't think it works very well, uh, but in fact, the Internet does. Why in the world would you put the government in charge of the Internet? And uh, as Ranking Member Eshoo said, uh, and also uh, my uh, good friend Ed Markey, uh, on net neutrality, I think that there's no secret that at least this side of the aisle is, is not particularly fond of uh, the new net neutrality uh, rules, and I know that some 300 members of Congress uh, contacted the FCC in the last year uh, voicing uh, such concerns and probably agree that that it really isn't the light touch uh, that we were we were hoping which is why in fact a CRA may be introduced uh, in the next couple of days uh, and the Congress of course then has uh, 60 days uh, legislative days uh, to act in, in both the House and the Senate. <coughs> Uh, Commissioner McDowell, you were very outspoken in your dissent on the need for a market analysis. Uh, would a market analysis have validated the order, uh, the order's consent? I don't think so. You know, each time the government has examined the broadband internet access market, whether it was the Federal Trade Commission in 2005, uh, the, uh, or 2007, the FCC itself in 2007, uh, the antitrust division, when they filed comments to the FCC a year ago in January, we can debate exactly what they said, but what they did not say, they did not say that there was a concentration and abuse of market power or any sort of market failure, uh, and that actually, in, in many of those cases, the uh, independent government agencies uh, had warned against the uncertainty and uh, the negative uh, collateral effects of potential regulation in this area. Uh you mentioned a little bit earlier uh, in response to the Madison River and, and the, uh, uh, the one phone company and, and a, a few others uh, as it related to uh, what the FCC had, had done. Are, do you believe that there are existing FCC remedies uh, that are in place uh, if, in fact, an Internet service provider engaged in that type of prospective conduct that this order is designed to prevent? I think there are laws already on the books uh, that would uh uh, prevent this or certainly reverse it, whether it's Section 2 of the Sherman Act or Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act. Uh, there are general consumer protection uh, powers that the government has here. So if it's a refusal to deal or exclusive dealings and things of that nature, uh, the government has the power to uh, cure that. And that was a little bit of the result of the, uh, or that, that uh, uh, debate and that answer came out of the Judiciary Committee yesterday. Is that not correct? Uh, That's what I read, of... yes, sir. Um, Chairman Janikowski, wouldn't it have been prudent for the Commission to do a simple market analysis before adopting the rules that, that we hear so much will burden uh, the industry if, in fact, the order is pursued? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the uh, order engages in extensive market analysis. Uh, there's a specific section on costs and benefits. Um, there's a footnote that points out that the order doesn't make a specific market power finding, uh, which would put this in the antitrust area. But the order extensively uh, analyzes the market. We received significant input and a record from market participants, economists, and uh, others. And so um, uh, I think uh, so the Commission engaged in extensive market analysis. Now, I know Verizon and others have uh, threatened, will be taking this uh, to, to court to, to look at a legal challenge. Has your legal team uh, give you an analysis that you think they think that this, this order will be able to stand on its two feet and will be verified by the um, by the courts? Yet, yes, they have. Uh, that it's consistent with the Communications Act, with Supreme Court precedent in this area, and with the D.C. Circuit Comcast decision last year. 
Mr. McDowell, do you agree with that? Well, I disagree. Obviously, I wrote a very lengthy dissent with 130 footnotes, mainly focusing on our lack of legal authority. <laughs> um, so I, I don't think uh, whatever court, uh, appellate court finally reviews it, ultimately, I think it'll fail an appeal. Uh, thank you. Yield back. Gentleman yields back his time and now recognize the Chairman Emeritus of the committee, Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think the American people would be outraged if they had some internet uh, carrier or some provider of the service to their home or their cable or, or uh, a uh, telephone company blocking what they can get on the internet or choosing something that benefited them economically and then keeping consumers from getting programs. So I don't think anybody, I hope nobody would think the idea of uh, stopping internet freedom, allowing the web to be treated in a neutral way, giving the consumers the power to access whatever they want. That's what I think the American people would support. And if they found that this was happening, they would want it stopped. Now, Chairman Janikowski, you think you had enough reason to believe this could happen unless you set some rules in place. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, freedom is a strange word. It's overused and misused a lot, especially around this place. Freedom for the consumer is to get whatever they hope to access. But that freedom can be curtailed, some people say by government, but it also could be curtailed by other private interests. And government sometimes has to regulate, hopefully in a light enough way that they don't discourage investment and, and, and competition and all the good things, but that the government needs to set rules of the road saying you cannot do this. Otherwise, we saw what happened in Wall Street, we see in other places, no regulation means less freedom for the consumers. Mr. Copps, is that what your thinking was uh, when you looked at the commission regulating in this area? I think that's uh, absolutely correct. That would reflect uh, the thinking I have. And, you know, we've talked about some of the specific uh, uh, problems that have come before the, uh, the Commission, but there's a historical uh, dimension uh, uh, to this, too. Uh, if, if this is such an open and dynamic and opportunity-creating technology, and to make sure that it is unfettered as we go down the road is so important. The history of every other uh, media generation that we've had shows that it goes from being open, first being touted as the great <clears throat> new opener and a great new uh, vista for the, for the American people's freedom, and inevitably what you get is closure and consolidation and tighter and tighter control. That's happened to radio, that's happened to television, that happened to the film industry, and I think we need to be taking some precautionary steps right. to make sure that that doesn't happen in this well, particular that, those technology Those precautionary here. steps could be taken by Congress. We could pass a law. We tried to pass a law. We even had most of the uh, uh, stakeholders agreeing to a law. We couldn't get the Republican members to pay attention to it. Congress could pass a law, but evidently the FCC thinks it has the power. And there's some dissent as to whether you have the legal authority or not. That will be decided by the courts. Uh, but Meanwhile, what you're trying to do is to preserve the freedom of the Internet. And, um, and a lot of the complaints we hear about s stopping innovation and, uh, and investment seem to be quite remarkable when you look at the fact that most of the groups that are being regulated feel this regulation is a light enough approach that will not have an undue impact on them. And, in fact, it's welcomed by everybody because it provides some regulatory certainty. Today in Bloomberg, they said investors so far don't seem to see the new rules as a threat. And they say that uh, uh, you look at Comcast, Time Warner, Cable, uh, AT&T, they're all saying they can live with this. So, uh, so um, it seems to me to sound the alarm over whether this was a good idea and whether we're hurting some of the industry in the United States is um, not accurate. But I found it interesting that one of the questions that was raised is how speculative the, the harm was for the interference in the Internet. And in order to attack the proposal, they raised the specter of price controls as a potential for the FCC. Does the FCC plan to do price controls? They say this is a slippery slope, opening the 
the road to regulation that's unfettered? Is that what's happening? No, not at all. This is no way about price controls. Does anybody on this group believe there ought to be price controls? Just if you see, think so, just say yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, uh, another chairman. Um, yeah. The, if you say those words inside of the walls of the FCC, there's trouble. No, no one. I, we don't serious. want price controls either. You don't want price controls. So to raise that as a specter, it seems to me unfortunate. Now, this Congressional Review Act not only repeals this rule, but it prevents the FCC from acting yep. at all in this area. And I would hope that uh, uh, Commissioner McDowell and Commissioner Baker wouldn't want to take the power away from the FCC to act when they feel it's appropriate to act if Congress hasn't passed any legislation. So I strongly hope we can stop that Congressional View Act uh, attempt to overturn the FCC's actions. Uh, yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize uh, the other Chairman Emeritus, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. And again, uh, nothing but compliments to the Commission for the um, intellectual ability that's assembled here. I'm I'm very proud that we have jurisdiction over the FCC and you know, on an individual basis I consider each of you friends. Having said that, I, I am I'm, I'm at a loss as I listen to what my good friend from California, Mr. Waxman, just said that uh, uh, l no regulation means less freedom. That is Orwellian in the extreme, just on the face of it. We're not so opposed, those of us that oppose this 3 to 2 ruling, because of what you ruled, but the fact that you established the principle, if it goes unchallenged, that you can regulate the Internet. That's what troubles me, not the light touch that Mr. Waxman refers to, the fact that if we let this ruling stand, this commission is not going to do price controls. I believe the gentlelady from South Carolina, when she says, you know, if you mouth the word price controls within the walls of the FCC, bad things happen. I, I understand that. But a future FCC could. That's why Chairman Upton and Chairman Walden and others are going to introduce this Congressional Review Act or a standalone bill uh, to overturn it. Uh, what Chairman Janikowski and the two commissioners that sided with him have said is, we've got the votes and we're going to establish the principle that we can regulate the Internet. Now, we understand how controversial that is, so we're, we're not going to do a lot. We're just going to try to get the nose of the camel under the tent. And once we've got that established in the future, some future commission can come, come forward. I'm so appreciative of Commissioner McDowell and his dissent and all the intellectual footnotes that he put into that. Uh, I'm very appreciative of what Commissioner Baker put in the record in her opening statement. I associate myself 100 percent with that. Um, it, it just seems to me that this ruling, when you listen to the answers to my friends on the minority side, you're concerned about potential ill uh, harm in the future. So you have to establish the principle now that we can regulate to protect against some unknown harm in the future. Now, Commissioner McDowell, you said, I believe in your dissent and again in your opening statement and again in response to a question, that the existing statutory law and authority that the FCC has is sufficient to handle any conceivable potential harm in the future without establishing these rules. Is that not correct? I think what I said is that uh, we have the government in general under con general consumer protection and antitrust laws has ample authority. So there are lots of agencies that could intervene. And uh, Mr. Copps, nobody's asked, Commissioner Copps, nobody's asked you a question yet and you're a bright fellow. <laughs> um, do you, why do you disagree with what the, uh, your fellow commissioner to, oddly to your left, uh, <laughs> just said. A little different take on this, uh, probably all of my colleagues, that the, uh, the commission has this uh, authority. 
has had this authority for a long time, has had this authority recognized by Congress and the courts for a long, long period of time, and that the best way for us to uh, express and exercise that authority is to put advanced telecommunications uh, uh, transmission back where it belongs, and that's in Title II. I think the Title I road that we went down has a, a substantially better chance in uh, court uh, than the previous uh, uh, decision that went on the Comcast case. But my best reading of the uh, statute and the legislative history and the court decisions is that this belongs within Title II. I do not know of a court in the land, including the Supreme Court, uh, uh, that, have, that has said we don't have that authority. In the Brand X case, I don't think the court could have been clearer uh, in saying that uh, the deference is accorded to the Commission in these cases where there is ambiguity or difference in the uh, definition of a statute or the terms of a statute. There are two or more reasonable uh, uh, ordinary ways to interpret it that uh, our choice of one of them is accorded uh, deference, and uh, they accorded deference to the decision that was made on cable modems in 2005 over my objection, but they also made clear that times change and our classification can change and our decisions can changing, and uh, Justice uh, Thomas and others were uh, eloquent in, uh, in pointing out that that's where the expertise to make a lot of these judgments uh, uh, reside. So uh, I am not as... Uh, 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 as, as, as much uh, in search for that uh, authority as, as some other folks are, I think is there. Thank you. Thank you. And I, we are going to do another round. Is that what yes, we are, sir. Thank and you. We appreciate uh, your response. I now go to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, for five. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, very much. Um, first of all, most of the industry uh, supported the uh, decision. Uh, Comcast has made a commitment to comply with them for uh, seven years as part of the Comcast NBCU merger conditions, regardless of the uh, outcome of any judicial review. Uh, many wished that the Commission had gone much further, restoring Title II authority uh, as Congress originally intended in the Telecom Act of 1996. I wish the Commission had gone much further than they did. Um, and, um, and let me also say that there's a misunderstanding here about uh, the Commission's role here. Uh, when AT&T had 1.2 million employees and they were the only phone company, it was the Commission that made the Carter phone decision that said that if you want to go down to a store and buy another phone other than the black rotary dial phone, you could do so. AT&T said, you're interfering with the free market if you let people go and buy another phone other than the black rotary dial phone. In the 1970s, uh, when MCI and Sprint were starting up, AT&T said that they should have to dial, that a consumer should have to dial 21 additional numbers before you reach the number that your mother told you to memorize in case you're ever in an accident. Well, those additional 21 numbers made it very hard to have competition, but the FCC made sure that competition and consumers would be king and queen. That's what the FCC has been doing over the years. There's a long history here of AT&T and, and the baby bells uh, of engaging in anti-competitive, anti-consumer activity. They said a phone call, a long-distance phone call, would, should cost a dollar a minute. Uh, before the government got in, um, when you were making a long distance phone call or you got one, you'd say, hurry, grandma's calling from California. It's long distance. And it was. It was a dollar a minute until we got the competition in and the FCC uh, ensured that there would be protection of consumers. Now it's under 10 cents a minute. So all of this history of light touch, yeah, light touch to make sure that a two by four didn't come in from uh, the big companies and, and crush the consumers, making them you know, be tipped upside down uh, and paying more than they should have to. So, Mr. Chairman, you know, we've fallen in the United States to 15th in broadband ranking in price and accessibility uh, and, in, uh, and in, in capacity. Uh, is this ruling part of your goal to make sure that America regains um, uh, its position as number one and two in the world before George Bush was sworn in uh, as chairman and appointed uh, the FCC that uh, was chaired by Michael Powell? 
Absolutely. And I'd say but before addressing that directly in response to what you said before, in each of those cases where the FCC took action to protect consumers, promote competition and innovation, someone sued. And someone said the sky would fall. And in each case, that's not what happened. Competition was enhanced, innovation was enhanced, um, uh, and the authority was established. Who sued after we passed the 1996 Telecom Act? Who a number of, the, number of the carriers. Verizon sued. They said, oh, that's <laughs> anti-competitive. Uh, Pac Bell sued. SBC sued. Bell Cell sued. They said, oh, that's anti-competitive. You're going to let more consumers in. The people who sued are the same companies that right now. No, actually, to AT&T and the NCTA and... Comcast credit, they're not saying that. It's Verizon that's coming in right. uh, and saying that they're going to sue. Right. But the rest of the industry so far has stayed on the sidelines. Yes, Mr. General. And, and, and on your point about U.S. leadership in innovation, it is so tied to preserving, in my opinion, uh, the freedom and openness of the Internet. Uh, I mentioned before uh, some of the Internet openness violations that we've seen even as protections were in place. One of the things that we heard from innovators, startup companies, technology companies in terms of harm that would occur now if we didn't adopt baseline rules is that without that, investment would dry up. Investment so in early stage... Predictability in the marketplace is very important to unleash billions of dollars of private sector investment. Exactly. For us to lead the world in innovation, in my opinion, we need to have rules in a climate that drive billions of dollars of investment uh, throughout the broadband economy to technology companies, early stage startup and investors, and also to our infrastructure. And I think what, in my opinion, what we've accomplished here, and it's why uh, there is a broad consensus in favor of this approach, is a framework in which there's certainty and investment is driven throughout the broadband 100%. economy. Does the FCC intend on following through on the law and launching a, a set-top box unbundling um, proceeding, an all-vid all video proceeding. Are you intending on doing that? Well, that's something that's under consideration, and we haven't announced uh, a timetable for that. But clearly, people uh, um, would like to see more innovation on their TV sets in their living room. Well, that's the, also language, that's the language, General. The that's the language Mr. Bliley and I put in the 1996 Act, and I really urge you. I think there's 100,000 new jobs that can be created. Uh, if we give consumers access to new applications and new hardware uh, out there in the marketplace. I thank you so much for all your good work. It was a, I think it was a very good decision that you made at the FCC. Gentlemen, time's expired. We now go to the Vice Chair of the Committee, Mr. Terry, for five. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me just start with uh, this observation, is that much of uh, our side of this dais, our concern is that and what we are opposed to is an agency, whether it's FCC or EPA, sua sponte, issuing a set of rules without congressional authority or specific authority from this body. And in fact, a majority of Congress in the past term under Democratic majority uh, signed on to letters opposing this rule or this procedure. And I'd like to, uh, for the record, uh, submit uh, unanimous consent to submit for the record the three letters dated October 15th, May 28th, and November 19th. I think Without the signature objection. on these uh, objecting to the procedures uh, are over 300 members, and, but yet the FCC continued. Um, now, I want to get to another issue that's been hit on here about uh, price regulation. I, at home and my uh, campaign, I have Trend Micro to block all of the viruses and spyware. And I got, as uh, my monthly newsletter, email newsletter from uh, Trend Micro there yesterday, coincidentally, uh, and I'm just going to read one part of Trend Micro, uh, Trend Setter newsletter here under net neutrality, sent all to all of their customers. For consumers, deregulation, which is ev what we're trying to, on this side of the aisle, evidently do, of the internet could mean higher internet access pri uh, prices as ISPs institute tiered models that offer speedier downloads to higher paying customers. 
Some people also worry that allowing businesses to choose what content or sites they'll be offered to whom the result in the uh, commoditization of a formerly free and open environment uh, akin to the evolution of television from an essentially free service to a highly fragmented and fairly expensive one. And like Anna Ashu said, we all agree on the blocking and we can get into the issue of the, the principal base that seemed to be working. But obviously, Trend Micro thinks that you have the power now and they want to get their customers lobbying here to make sure that you have the power of price setting. Then under 706, Section 7, oh, and by the way, uh, unanimous consent to submit uh, Trend Micro uh, e-newsletter on net neutrality. And then Section 706A says that uh, this is the basis for your authority uh, in the order as stated, that price cap regulation is part of this. So obviously, if you're saying that se Section 706 is the basis for your authority, you have authority to regulate prices. And out there that are now manipulating this rule to from the FCC. Uh, this seems to me to be anti-competitive uh, and creates a heck of an atmosphere of uncertainty to new entrants and business operations about what can the FCC do to them or for them. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Ms., uh, Ms. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Baker, has the FCC in developing this rule uh, made any conclusions about the cost effect of flattening a tier to a one price system like Trend Micro system or ten, uh, Trend Micro is requesting and saying that you should be doing? Has that been thought through? Is there an economic analysis of how that will affect the marketplace? Uh, it's a good question and one of the biggest concerns that I have is where we're going with this in preserving the status quo of the Internet today, we're, we're missing what the Internet may offer tomorrow. And so I think that through the special interest groups as they push in to tighten the regulations through uh, wireless, such as the Metro PCS complaint that has been mentioned, or specialized services or prioritization eliminating these, they will eliminate what is going to um, fund our next generation of broadband networks. So I, I worry that we, in the rush to put out net neutrality rules, we're missing, we're flattening a one size, to a one-size-fits-all broadband what may be the next generation of the Internet. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Michigan, the chairman emeritus of the committee, Mr. Dingle, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy. Um, <clears throat> to Chairman Ganohevsky, there is broad agreement that reform of the Universal Service Fund is necessary. I believe that if done properly, such reform can support broadband build-out and create jobs. Will you commit to completing proceedings to reform USF by the end of the year? Yes, yes. or no? Yes. Uh, to the remaining commissioners, uh, going across, starting with you, Mr. Cobbs, uh, do you uh, support the idea that um, we should have a, a completed survey by the end of the year? Mr. Cobbs? A completed survey of? Of, of the spectrum. Yes, I think it would be most helpful to have okay. a, a, a spectrum, and it's a time-consuming process, but the sooner we can get it, uh, the Thank better you. it would be. Commissioner McDowell? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Clyburn? Uh, yes, we've already started in that direction with a st spectrum dashboard and other initiatives. And the last of our commissioners. Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, again, Chairman Ganohevsky, I understand that the commission is completing a spectrum inventory. Is that true, yes or no? Yes. Uh, again, to Chairman Ganohevsky, when will the commission have completed this inventory? Well, we've already completed the first phase. Our spectrum dashboard is up on our website. Uh, we'll be proceeding the next phase relatively soon, and we want to provide the public more and more information about how Spectrum is actually being used. Now, uh, again, uh, Mr. Chairman, will that inventory be as comprehensive 
as the one mandated last year in the House passed Radio, Radio Spectrum Inventory Act, yes or no? Yes, and we've been working with the committee on that. Now again, Mr. Chairman, similarly, will the results of the Commission's Spectrum Inventory be made available to the public, yes or no? Yes, unless there's some compelling reason for a piece to not be, but yes. Now, will the Commission also submit a report to the Congress concerning the inventory? Concerning the inventory? Yes. Uh, we'll make it public and we'll provide Congress and the committee whatever reports it desires. Good. Now, again, Mr. Chairman, with respect to the spectrum auctions, I note the National Broadband Plan states on page 7-9 that the government's ability to reclaim, clear, and re-auction spectrum is the ultimate backstop against market failure and is an, is, and is an appropriate tool when the voluntary process stalls entirely. Does this mean that the Commission will forcefully take spectrum from broadcasters if too, if too few participate in voluntary spectrum auctions? Yes or no? Well, we haven't addressed that question. We've proposed a win-win-win uh, incentive auction that will free up billions of dollars and bring market incentives uh, into spectrum allocation, helping give this country what it needs, a lot more spectrum for mobile broadband. Now, I'm just a poor Polish lawyer from Detroit, and sometimes I have trouble understanding some of these things. <laughs> but you're going to have a uh, you're, you're you're going to have a voluntary spectrum auction. How is it going to be voluntary if uh, it if if there is pressure which is placed on the holders of this spectrum by the commission? Uh, because the auctions themselves would rely on market incentives, uh, allowing the market to set a price for uh, existing owners of licenses to make the choice between continuing what they're doing or um, uh, transferring the license uh, in exchange for the, uh, for the offer from the auction. Sounds kind of like a bank holdup to me. You hold a gun at the teller's head and say, uh, we know that you are going to voluntarily give me this money, and if you don't, I'm going to shoot you in the brains. Yeah. And only, only if the free market is a bank holdup. Well, I've, I want you to know I have some dark suspicions on this matter. Now, Mr. Chairman, do you believe that a broadcaster who does not participate in voluntary incentive auction should be forced to relinquish its current channel allocation and spectrum? Yes or no? Well, uh, uh, the first thing I'd say is that broadcasting is a very important business in the country, and everything no, we're no, doing no. in yes, this area no. recognizes importance. I'm uh, sorry? Uh, that's something we're looking at. It's, a, it's something that actually Congress is looking at because well, we need authority here in order to proceed. Would you please go off, contemplate your navel, and, and, and come back with us with an answer yes or no to this question? And would the other members of the Commission please do the same thing because I'm having a hard time understanding this. Now, to all commissioners, does the commission possess the necessary authority with which to engage in voluntary incentive auctions of a spectrum? Yes or no? Uh, we've asked Congress for the authority. I'm sorry? We've asked Congress for the authority. All right. Uh, uh, would, the other, would each of the commissioners submit to me a yes or no on that? And then the gentleman's time's expired. Okay. The, the sure, commissioners, would like, sure would like to have an answer to this question. Yes, if the commissioners go ahead and, and respond to the, general, the, the now, Chairman Emeritus's question. I do have a few other useful questions that, that I'd like to get the answer to. I will be submitting a letter to the Commission. I would ask that the Commission respond. And Mr. Chairman, I would ask your courtesy and that of my colleagues on the committee in giving me unanimous consent so that both my letter and the response may be inserted into the record. Of the Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. And uh, just for the record, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, the committee is going to have a second round of questions here today if uh, other conflicts in your schedule Mr. don't Chairman, preclude your I don't your want attendance. you to take my comments as critical of you. Thank you. No, uh, we're fine. All right, with that, uh, we'll, did, you, did the other members of the commission want to answer that question the Chairman Meredith asked? Yes or no? I think the Chairman's answer, we have asked uh, Congress for that authority, is correct? Mr. I don't think we have the authority to do the incentive auctions as many proposals have outlined. Waiting for authority, so right now, no. To do voluntary authority, we need congressional authority. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go now to uh, Mr. Shimkus for five minutes. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's great to have the Commission before us. I uh, appreciate all the time. Many of you have come by to talk in the office one-on-one, uh, -on -one, and, and that really is appreciated. The, uh, I learned a new uh, Latin word, sua sponte. So, uh, Mr. Copps, I think via sua sponte, maybe we can address the two-member rule, and we'll legislate. Maybe we can do that. I, I just think it is ridiculous, and if there needs to be a ch uh, someone to lead that, small change. We might be able to do small things in this Congress that don't get devolved into too much, but that is really a silly. And we say that every, you say it every time, and many of us agree with you, and we don't seem to do anything on it. So uh, let me see if I can take that up as a, as a challenge. Um, you know, this net neutrality debate, uh, one side says it's going to create jobs. The other side says, no, it's going to hurt jobs. And we are focused in this Congress on job creation. The, um, the public gets confused. Who's right and who's wrong? It's he said, she said. I boil it down to the, the simplest folks in, in my district to, you know, they just want, if they can get broadband service, we still don't have it. High speed, that's mapping and all the other things. Uh, but I, they really do um, want, want jobs. You know, the presidents, you know, if we're not going to spend money, we're not going to borrow money in this Congress to try to create jobs. We think that failed in the last Congress. Plus, we're talking about debt, deficit, and job creation. That's our. This is government control of the microphones. Government control. I'm, I'm on. I'm on again. So, if we're going to. Uh, create jobs without spending money, we have to ease the regulatory burden. I, I don't know how, because that, that provides more certainty. Capital borrowing is lowered when you have more certainty, uh, ease, ease in the regulatory burden. The President's agreed to that. Um, uh, I think, Mr. Janikowski, you sent out an email asking your agency to look at ways where exerted regulatory burden might impinge job creation. So let me ask uh, Commissioner Baker, had we done a cost-benefit analysis, if we would have done a cost-benefit analysis on net neutrality, job creation, do you think that would be something we wouldn't want to get an answer to? What do you think we, we would have come up with? It's a good question. Um, I think uh, had we done a market analysis, certainly every government, uh, every other government that has looked at this has come up with the fact that the hypothetical problem of net neutrality would be better served if we're worried about on-ramps to the internet. The best way to solve that is to create more on-ramps. So aside from the actual authority question, I think the policy would come up that the market benefit analysis would come out in not in favor of this. This is a, just an interesting debate because we even heard you know, Chairman Waxman make the statement, and I heard it yesterday in my, my environment and the economy hearing, that regulations create jobs. Um, and, and they really believe it, that regulations create jobs. Um, I guess he also said, uh, I'm not sure what, but in, in the hearing yesterday, the EPA also in their statement saying, we're not going to look at job creation. We're not going to look at effects on the economy. So uh, that's why we think there should always be uh, at least an analysis of cost-benefit analysis. on where, And had this been done prior to promulgation of movement towards net neutrality through the commission, maybe there would be more certainty. And, their side would be pointing out to your analysis, and we'd be looking at that analysis and saying, yeah, it's legit or it's not, but nothing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Commissioner, uh, uh, Chairman, you want to respond? Uh, as, as I said before, we did do a market analysis, uh, uh, and I, I disagree with my colleague very strongly. I think the uh, pro-job, pro-investment outcomes of this balanced framework that we adopted uh, uh, very much outweigh uh, the burdens which people either say are very small indeed or highly speculative. Let me, let me just chime in because, you know, I've been on the committee for a long time and just like, you know, Mr. Markin can talk about going back to the, the breakup of the bells, you know, I, I can talk, you know, when the cell phone was a little brick, a mini brick, 
when I got elected, and you had to change the roaming when you got here, to now really voice is really the throwaway service. It's been an unregulated environment that's moved faster than we can even, we, we can even get there, get there now. Um, and that our, again, our concern is if we're not doing cost-benefit analysis uh, uh, on regulations, the regulations may be important, but the public needs to be able to make the decision based upon impact on jobs versus benefits received. And that's uh, our, our frustration. Let me ask one more question on this net neutrality debate. And it's, it's not to pick on the chairman, but uh, recently um, I, you're, you're offering to, uh, to applications to kind of spy, I don't know, spy is not a good word, but to patrol the internet yeah, to see if there's right. abuse of net neutrality and are prepared to, I, I see it, prepare to fly the winner out here. Uh, do you think that's a good use of taxpayers' dollars? Promoting transparency, uh, opening up, um, uh, giving to consumers and early stage innovators better information about that, how the networks work. Uh, I think promoting transparency is a very important part of this. Gentlemen's time's expired. I now turn to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, for five. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Boy, I'll, I'll tell you, there's probably not two words that have been more misused uh, and confused than the words net neutrality. And I would venture to say if you asked the 435 members of Congress what their definition of net neutrality is, you'd probably get 435 different answers. But let me tell you what it means to me. I have four kids. Now, my three boys, they were the first three kids we had, all went to Penn State, my alma mater. But our youngest, uh, who came seven years after our youngest son, Allie, she's a free spirit, and she decided to break tradition and go to the University of Dayton, where she is now finishing up her final semester. But one thing, you know, Allie growing up with three brothers, uh, it was just obvious she was going to be a sports fan. And she loves the Pittsburgh Steelers, and she loves the Pittsburgh Penguins. Well, one of the things she discovered right away when she went to the University of Dayton is that she was being subjected to watching Cincinnati Bengal football and the Columbus Blue Jackets hockey team. Uh, I felt very badly for her. She come home one weekend and she had this little device in her hand and she said, Dad, we have to hook up this device in the house. And I said, what is it? And she says, it's called a sling box. I, I didn't know what a sling box was, so I said, you know, you got to be careful. Your kids bring things home and, and you don't know what they're bringing home. And I said, Allie, what is it? And, and her eyes lit up. She says, you're not going to believe this. You hook this to your cable and then you hook it to the internet connection and then I can watch Pittsburgh Steelers and Pittsburgh Pen Penguin games in Dayton, Ohio. And so we hooked it up and she gets to watch Pittsburgh Steelers and Pittsburgh Penguin games in Dayton, Ohio. So this is when I decided this is what open internet means to me. It means that one, my family can use any service on the internet using any device we choose to use. Two, we give innovators the ability to create new things for us so that we can use our internet connections and, and, and new gadgets for us to use that we never dreamed possible. And then three, we provide a cop on the beat to make sure that all these promises of an open internet are, are kept for us. Now, Mr. Chairman, that seems to me to roughly be what the FCC order is. Is, is that right? Well, in fact, Sling uh, was one application that uh, had been blocked uh, and, and uh, is an issue that gave rise to the concerns that led to our order. So it seems to me that the rules that you promulgated, they're aimed to protect me. Uh, they're aimed to protect innovation. And, and I could quote from the companies, and I think we've heard them before, AT&T or Wall Street analysts from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Citi, Wells Fargo, Raymond James, uh, who all called the ruling balanced or a light touch and no undue impact on carriers. Uh, I noticed that some of my friends on the other side of the aisle, and, and I think also uh, Commissioner Baker spoke to this, that they said that they believe the FCC should only issue, issue rules when there's a market failure. I have to tell you, I think that's a bad model. That's like saying you can only create rules for mortgages when housing prices plummet, or that you can't ensure that ensure new investors aren't being built 
until millions have lost their nest eggs. Mr. Chairman, do you think the FCC should only create rules when the Internet ceases to be useful as it is today, or only when it won't do the things that our constituents expect it to do? No, of course not. And we heard from people who have been uh, building all the content and services on the Internet that given the history, if we didn't adopt a sensible framework, we'd see a decline in investment, a decline in new businesses starting, a decline in jobs being created. What I'm proud of is that we were able to find a way to provide certainty and confidence to the entrepreneurs and companies building new businesses on the Internet and also give certainty and confidence to the infrastructure companies to increase their level of investment. I'm proud of that. It took a lot of work. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Copps and, and Commissioner McDowell, uh, and, and these are just some, some quick yes or no answers. Uh, one of the biggest areas of controversy in this open Internet order is the citation of FCC authority. But rather debating whether a specific provision of the Communications Act grants FCC direct or indirect authority to regulate broadband providers, which is now going to be up to the courts to decide. I want to ask you a few questions about the way Congress has approached broadband. In 2008 Farm Bill, Congress directed the FCC to submit a comprehensive rural broadband strategy with recommendations for the rapid build out of broadband in rural areas. Are you both familiar with that, regulate, with that legislation? I yes. was the acting chairman of the commission at the time that helped produce the report. Thank you. In that same year, Congress also passed the Broadband Data Improvement Act to improve FCC's data collection process and promote the deployment of affordable broadband services to all parts of the nation. Have you both heard of that bill? Yes. yes. And in 2009, Congress passed the Recovery and Reinvestment Act directing the FCC to produce a national broadband plan with a detailed strategy for achieving affordability of such service and maximum utilization of broadband infrastructure and service by the public. I know you're both familiar with that legislation. So given the number of laws that Congress has passed on broadband that directly involve the FCC, doesn't it seem logical to you that Congress assumed the agency would have the ability and the authority to implement and oversee our nation's broadband policies. The gentleman's time has expired here. I want them to have an answer, but Thank if you. we have a five-minute answer, we could have issues. How about yes? There Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Congressman, you make a good point, which is uh, Congress had a chance during each of those times to uh, pass net neutrality legislation, and it did not. Mr. Chairman? Well, I would say yes as well. And Congress, it's, uh, Congress has clearly given the FCC the authority to look at competition issues involving voice and video. Uh, it's well accepted that the FCC has authority over Internet access providers. Uh, so I'm quite confident in the legal uh, basis of the decision and in its constraints on the FCC. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield Baker. Yeah. Thank Clyburn. you. I have, two, I have two, two quick points. First is that the, sling, the sling box, I'm a big fan. Um, I was one of the first adopters. The problem with Slingbox when it, was, when it was blocked was because it was taking so much capacity on the wireless network that we needed to make it more efficient, which is why I promote entities like the BTAG, which is a non-governmental group of engineers who can work to make more efficient a lot of these problems that are coming up much faster than the government process can be. And the other point I'd like to say is that certainly you gave us the broadband plan job to do, which was very important and a terrific landmark of our, our um, our tenures at the FCC, 200 of those recommendations came forward, 60 of those are within the FCC's jurisdiction. Um, I think this is something that is going to be right. multi-jurisdictional and we need to all work together. Ms. Kleinberg, do you have any adi quick additions? My colleagues have amply... Uh, yes, they have. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> General lady from Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. We indeed have looked forward to this. Um, and Chairman Jenikowski, I want to start with you. We've uh, tried to get together and visit on a few things, and I do have a couple of questions. Uh, let's go to the Com Comcast NBCU merger, which I think was an overreach of power and a mismanagement of resources, and it should have been a very simple, straightforward, vertically integrated merger, and it ended up becoming a forum for groups with complaints and grievances and then uh, regulations and conditions and open internet and net neutrality attachments to that merger. So I've got about three questions and of course you know we need to move quickly on this. Uh, is this how you're going to approach uh, mergers in the future? The 
Comcast NBCU transaction was one of the most the biggest and most complex that ever came to the agency, and we handled in a way that was, uh, I think, the most professional um, uh, review process. Um, uh, completing the process uh, at about the time uh, that people thought were on the earlier end, and making sure that consumers and competition were okay. protected. Okay. Do you expect the, or is it the goal? of the FCC is currently configured to legislate policy for every merger that comes before the Commission? We'll, we'll um, continue to exercise the responsibilities that Congress gave us under the Communications Act to review mergers and determine that they're in the public Okay. Interest. Do you think that the review should have lasted for over a year? Uh, uh, that was what the companies expected when they um, uh, uh, announced their decision. Uh, it was on the fast end for transactions of that size. Was done. See, very I think it was on the slow end because you get in the way of jobs creation. We're all about making certain. And the the interactive technology sector is one of the few sectors creating jobs. Commissioner McDowell, in light of how long the merger took, have we reached the point that we need to initiate a stop clock? Uh, put that in place to prevent needless dragging on, uh, which hampers job creation. Of course, the FCC has a 180-day shot clock, uh, but enforcement of that would be helpful. Thank you. Commissioner Baker, uh, what would you like to have seen done differently in the merger reviews, and what would you do differently in the future when you look at this merger? Well, I think it's clear that we need a comprehensive review, but I agree that it can be timely, and our, our internal shot clock of 100, 180 days is a good target and a good time frame that should be enforced. I think that the breadth, scope, and duration of the restrictions placed on the merging companies was um, shows sort of the extraordinary leverage that we held over the parties in front of us merging. I would like to see the merger conditions um, have a nexus to the actual merger. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, let's talk about peering and interconnectivity. Uh, we know that these arrangements have never been regulated, and the FCC net neutrality order says that the rules do not cover peering. So, Mr. Chairman, do you believe the Commission's new net neutrality order and its underlying rules govern the Level 3 Comcast dispute? Well, as you said, the order says that uh, it doesn't change anything with respect to existing peering arrangements. It applies to Internet access service provided to consumers and small businesses. Uh, you're referring to a dispute that's occurring outside the Commission, a commercial dispute. I hope those parties settle it and resolve it, but it's not something that we have facts and data on. Uh, I do think the order speaks for itself in the way that you suggest. Okay. All right. Commissioner Dowell, do you believe the FCC has the authority it's claiming to govern interconnectivity agreements? Peering? Yes. No, ma'am. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner Clyburn, thank you for coming in and visiting with me a few weeks ago. Um, I, you and I discussed a little bit about market failure at that point, and you believe there has been. I believe there has not been. Mm -hmm. So why don't you tell me where you think the market failure lies and why the Internet is broken and why we need to look at these burdensome regulations, because I am hearing every single day from innovators that are very concerned about the overreach that they see, what this might do, and open the door for your commission to regulate everything from set-top boxes uh, to privacy to you name it. There have, in fact, been formal and informal complaints lodged at the commission. Uh, there have been uh, persons who have come to my office who have called, who have emailed um, when I go to uh, different uh, meetings and, and um, a public forum for a you know, they mentioned that there are issues, that these issues and, and, and the and cause uncertainty in the market okay. and, and cause them to have problems with financing. So there are issues. There have been formal complaints, and a lot of these companies do not have the ability and the technical know-how to come okay, forward. My time has expired. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the second round. Thank you. Indeed. Uh, we'll now go to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Matsui, Thank for five. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the commissioners and the chairman for being with us today. I support the FCC's open Internet order because it lays the foundation to create market certainty that both protects consumers and spurs innovation and investment in our economy. And I believe that any attempt to repeal this order should be characterized as stifling innovation and discouraging job growth in the technology sectors of our economy. 
Now, I'm co-chair of the High Tech Caucus, and one of my priorities is to new innovative sectors like smart grid and health IT that offer great economic and job growth opportunities for our nation. Technology companies are poised to deploy a range of new technologies to businesses and residential customers alike to ensure and increase energy efficiency efforts and modernize our health care system. Mr. Chairman, I believe broadband will play a key role in advancing smart grid technologies and health IT. How does the open internet order promote the advancement of these sectors? Well, I agree that those are very important areas for uh, dramatic private investment in the years ahead, for the U.S. to build uh, industries that provide real benefits to the public and uh, devices and products and applications we can export to the rest of the world. What the open internet, internet order does is give entrepreneurs, companies thinking about innovating in that space, the confidence that if they invest the resources and the time to innovate, they will have access to a free and open market, be able to reach customers and let consumers in the market pick winners and choosers, well, winners and losers. Uh, and so it's a great opportunity for those segments. Okay, thank you. And I believe one important way to move our economy forward is to increase access to affordable broadband service to more Americans. And, and that's why in the coming weeks I plan to reintroduce the Broadband Affordability Act to expand the Universal Service Fund lifeline link-up services for universal broadband adoption. Mr. Chairman, do you believe your open internet order will further lay a foundation that helps increase broadband adoption rates in this country and further bridge our nation's digital divide? I do, because it promotes uh, a, virtual, a virtuous cycle of private investment throughout the broadband economy uh, that will accelerate um, uh, the opportunities and benefits of the Internet for all Americans. Now, I want to follow up on um, Ranking Member Waxman's question earlier on market certainty, because I believe this is an important point. Over the course of this debate, we kept hearing that industry wanted certainty so they could move forward with investment and their businesses. Now, it's widely known that a number of leading economists and financial institutions have stated that on balance, these rules represent a light touch that provides regulatory certainty that broadband providers and our tech community need to attract new investments and grow. So that my sense is that any attempts to repeal in any form would create uncertainty for investors and the market, which puts American innovation, investment, and growth at risk. So, again, what gives here? I mean, we need certainty, and yet, and this is sort of a light regulation, and yet we're saying, other side is saying mm -hmm. that this is going to put a stranglehold on innovation. So, comments I'm, here? I, I'm concerned about that. I, I uh, for years, there's been a war in this space between the infrastructure companies on one side and the innovation technology companies on the other side. Um, what we worked very hard to do over this process is to say, hey, look, the gap isn't that large. Let's resolve this in a sensible way with light touch rules, uh, move forward because we need all the companies in the broadband economy to work together to grow the broadband economy uh, and to deal with the global competitive threats that we face. Uh, I believe we achieved that. I believe that injecting new uncertainty into it now um, uh, uh, will create more harm than good. Okay. Any other comments on that? Um, I, I, like all of us would love, we would all love certainty. Um, unfortunately, I think the only certainty would actually be is if Congress would act to give us this authority. Um, I think, unfortunately, that, well, I think the f courts will turn this around. I think we have a complaint process set up in our rules. <coughs> um, they, we also have a declaratory ruling process set up in our rules. I think all of these leave leave inroads for changes, and I also think we have a two-year review that is also set up to change the rule as it exists. So I think that the certainty is actually more uncertainty with the rule we adopted. Well, my time is running out, but I would just like to say that this is a debate that continues to go on, and we understand we must have some regulations. We understand that, and we're hopeful that in this case, this light touch will really spur innovation, which I believe it will. So thank you very much. General A's time has now expired. I'll turn to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Gingrey. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and let me thank the uh, chairman and the, and the other four commissioners for being here today. I 
associate myself with Mr. Barton's comments earlier, the gentleman from Texas, in regard to the level of expertise that you bring. Uh, obviously, well, we've spent a lot of time uh, talking about this, and I would say that uh, the members on this side of the aisle uh, feel like that this uh, net neutrality ruling, uh, this three to two split decision, was really unnecessary, uh, a hammer in search of a nail, if you will. And our colleagues on the other side of the aisle feel like that uh, uh, very much necessary. In fact, my, my good friend from Pennsylvania uh, talked about the necessity. I think he's put it as a, a need for a cop on the beat. Uh, I would suggest that if there's no history of crime on, on the beat, is it cost effective to put a cop there? Uh, and in fact, he went on to talk about uh, his daughter using the uh, sling box. I never heard of the sling box, but sounded like a heck of a good innovation. And, and I guess that certainly came, came online at a time uh, before this three to two ruling. So with that in mind, I'm going to uh, ask my first question to the chairman, uh, Chairman Jenikowski, in the, in the national broadband plan that was released by the commission uh, last March. Uh, page five stated that, and a quote, the role of government is and should remain limited. Uh, yet I find the order delivered in the three to two vote by the commission to contradict this very statement. You say in your testimony that the so-called open internet rules will promote innovation. And maybe you can give me a yes or no answer on this. Has there been a lacking of innovation in the absence of government regulation over the Internet during the past decade? As I mentioned, there have been Internet protections in place since at least 2005. And so in the space, people were operating on the assumption that Internet freedom was assured. Well, the question again, yes or no, has there been a lack of innovation? Uh, uh, let me see. There's not been a lack of innovation because I, there's been I'll a take that as a no. And uh, <laughs> if there's not been a problem with innovation, then why? Why is it necessary to promulgate regulations that may well stifle innovation, at least according to a December 31st, 2010 report from Anna Maria Kovacs? Well, what we uh, heard from uh, the innovator community was that in the absence of sensible rules of the road, uh, they wouldn't have the confidence and certainty they need to invest their time and resources to raise capital in order to continue to innovate, and they felt very strongly about it. But yet, you know, the, uh, uh, the innovation that we hear about, like the example of the sling box and other things, I mean, you know, this is sort of speculative, it would seem to me. Uh, and as a result of this order, uh, despite the assurance of your testimony, will they not be a subsequent drop-off in innovation due to this unnecessary, as we see it, government regulation? I think this is a spur to innovation both at the edge and in the infrastructure, and I think the statements from most of the companies in the space and analysts in the space are consistent with that. I don't see how then you can make that sort of assurance without the proper market analysis which the Commission today ha has admitted did not occur. Uh, with respect, we did do a market analysis uh, in our, our order. Is my time expired? Uh no, but you might want to ask the chairman if it's an OIRA standard market analysis as recommended by OMB, and if so, if you can make it available. Uh, uh, we'll obviously make it available. It's in the, it's in the order, and, uh, and we'll get back to you on whether it is uh, OIRA. specifically OIRA yeah. compliant. Mr. Chairman, if I have... You, you actually have another minute. We, we didn't restart okay, the clock, okay, so you're thank, counting thank up. You. Uh, I wanted to ask Commissioner McDowell. Uh, Commissioner, isn't the full, uh, the, the order, isn't this order full of doublespeak? To me, certainly it is. It says to keep the Internet free, we need to regulate it. To ensure no one needs permission to innovate, everyone will need to ask the FCC, FCC for permission to innovate. And it goes on to say uh, to create certainty, as few as three commissioners now can decide what types of business arrangements and traffic management techniques are reasonable. Does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. And I think what we're hearing today from the chairman as well as in the order is that innovation only happens at the edge. Uh, we, he's referred to several times about innovators and the technology companies at the edge, and there's just infrastructure on the other side, the network operators. We want to have innovators everywhere. You have companies like uh, Microsoft and Google as well as Verizon and AT&T who have thousands of miles of fiber have servers and uh, soft switches. They offer voice, video, and data services of all kinds and all sorts of applications. And you don't want government uh, tilting the scales or putting its thumb on the scale to try to uh, 
distort that market. You want innovation at all, layer, all layers, all levels of that in environment. The gentleman's time's expired. Now I'll recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Weldon. I, I do want to say I'm pleased to see the FCC commissioners here today. And I, I want to touch on two topics uh, with Chairman Jenik Jenikowski. And, and again, I have to apologize because I know that some of this is repetitive. I'll try not to be. Um, the first is to follow up to a letter I wrote to you last spring regarding the Title II framework you had initially laid out regarding the Internet principles. And I, I wanted to reiterate my concerns regarding agency action. I, I was the chairman of the Subcommittee on Health, and I'm, I'm still the ranking member. And in that capacity, I'm increasingly sensitive about the tendency of government agencies, and in particular independent agencies, to arrogate to themselves policymaking authority that's properly exercised solely by Congress, in my opinion. Now, while questions involving an agency exceeding the authority granted to it by Congress are decided in the courts, I think an agency ought to be mindful of the limits on its authority. So far, two companies have questioned your authority and brought suit against you. Can you tell me, I, I, this is sort of repetitive, so I wanted to say if you could tell me uh, why you believe the agency has legal authority to implement network neutrality rules or provisions of the National Broadband Plan in the order being examined today. But let me say specifically, because you've you know, gone into this, where you believe um, you have the authority, you know, what, what would you cite? And why you think uh, you're going to win in the court? Maybe I'll, I'll say it that way. is a little different, maybe. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm glad you've asked the question because it uh, it, it it allows me to try to clear up one issue. Uh, uh, there were many members of Congress who, in the course of our proceeding, urged us not to rely on Title II as a basis for any decision in the area, and. Uh, 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 after a lot of discussion and input, we listened to that, we heard that, and in fact, we didn't rely on Title II and that um, uh, in adopting our final decision. And instead, we adopted uh, a framework that's consistent with the framework that historically has had consensus in the space, the light touch Title I framework tied to uh, specific provisions in the Communications Act, like those those um, uh, 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 instructing us to promote competition. And so uh, I do remember getting your letter, and it was something that we paid careful ten attention to and that we believe uh, we responded directly to and how we ultimately um, uh, ruled in this matter. And, how, and why do you think you're going to win? Well, we think we're going to win because we think that what we, uh, the, the theory we've laid out is uh, very consistent with Supreme Court precedent in this area. Uh, and it's consistent with the D.C. Circuit uh, decision. The D.C. Circuit was asked to rule that the FCC had no authority at all with respect to broadband, and it didn't do that. It set a standard that the FCC has to reach in order to adopt sensible rules in this area. Uh, uh, and we believe we met that standard. It's in litigation uh, now. Almost everything uh, that, it, that, um, uh, that the FCC does ends up in litigation. Um, uh, there's some areas in which the D.C. Circuit decision is in tension with the Supreme Court, but we believe we meet the standard of the D.C. Circuit case, uh, and we're certain that we meet uh, the standards set out by the Supreme Court in this area, and they're operating well within our authority under the Communications Act. All right, now let me get to my second uh, issue. Uh, this was an issue I raised last summer, or I should say last May. Congress learned that Google had gained access to personal Wi-Fi and collected information about consumers' internet activities, and at the time, I called on the FCC and the FTC to investigate out of concern for consumers' privacy. Now, the FTC investigation was dropped in October without providing sufficient answers, in my opinion, to how the privacy breach was allowed to take place and who was affected. But I understand that the FCC is also investigating. Cause, so could you comment on any progress with that investigation, whether the FCC is examining the data for itself, what steps are being taken to avoid situations like this in the future? in today's uh, technology age? Um, I, I, I can't comment on an open investigation, but I will say that um, uh, we certainly heard you in that letter, and uh, any uses of uh, spectrum or um, technologies that are within the FCC's purview uh, that violate uh, the privacy statute and the FCC's privacy rules are actions that we would take very seriously. Okay, as far as you can go, in other words. All right, thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. Now go to the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you hosting this hearing. I appreciate all of the FCC commissioners coming to talk about 
uh, this important issue of net neutrality and, and its impact, especially on the economy and our ability to continue to encourage the innovation and the job creation that I think has been one of the hallmarks uh, of the Internet. I, I would actually agree uh, with the commissioner back in 1999, uh, Commissioner uh, is it Kennard, who had talked about uh, the innovations and also encouraged against the dangers of regulating the Internet. Uh, actually, was and this was President Clinton's SEC chairman uh, or commissioner that talked about the dangers of regulating the Internet, uh, especially in ways that it would stifle innovation. You know, when I look at uh, what's been happening in the industry, I think one of the one of the few real positive signs in, in a struggling economy that we have today is has been the technology sector, has been uh, especially uh, the the companies that do operate and, and innovate uh, using the internet and its capabilities to uh, to allow commerce to uh, to allow a connectivity of of people of ideas uh, you know they're even talking about uh, what's happening in Egypt being something that that really in, in many ways came out of of Facebook and and of course these great innovations happened without net neutrality uh, these great innovations happened because there was a a certainty and an ability for industry to go out there and invest uh, as I think it was Commissioner Baker who pointed out over five hundred billion dollars of private investment this isn't federal government with stimulus but private investment coming out uh, over the last ten years of the private sector to to encourage this innovation uh, and this was again without net neutrality without the big hand of the federal government or the big hammer as you might want to call it and so I guess it, you, you can see why there is a big concern by uh, many of us about this uh, this imposition of net neutrality and this is not just a Republican issue I know some on the other side have, have kind of inferred that this is the way it should be I was a little bit surprised to hear the three Democratic commissioners uh, saying that they don't think that this Congress should pass a resolution of disapproval uh, because when when I go back to the Constitution which is of course our, our overarching document uh, that lays out the, the structure of our government it, it is article 1 section 1 that talks about the legislative branch uh, deciding policy, not, uh, with all due respect, not the FCC, not the EPA, not all of these bureaucratic agencies that seem to think uh, that, that their will is better than, than those of us who were actually elected by the people. And so with that, uh, I want to, to at least uh, try to get into this a little bit more. And Chairman Janikowski, starting with you, when we look at the private sector innovation that's come uh, with the ability to innovate and then, of course, the business models that are built around uh, the things that encourage private investment. Uh, do you have any concern that by, by changing the rules, by imposing net neutrality, and in some cases opening the door for retroactive changes, that you're going to discourage that kind of innovation and investment? Well, I, I actually agree with what Commissioner McDowell said a few minutes ago about the importance of the investment and innovation throughout the broadband economy, uh, both uh, early stage and technology companies, and also uh, our, our infrastructure companies, wireless and, and wired. It's a full broadband economy where innovation and investment in any part of it fuels investment through, throughout. Uh, we paid very careful attention to this as we worked on, uh, on this item. Uh, and, and I believe this will be a spur to investment and innovation throughout the broadband economy. And uh, overwhelmingly, the, the, the analysts who looked at what we did um, uh, characterized it that way as a, a light touch action mm -hmm. that increases certainty and will unleash uh, yeah. investment. And, and I guess I will, we'll disagree about whether it's a light touch and whether it increases certainty versus what, what, what many of us are hearing that it actually is, is decreasing certainty. I'll ask. Uh, Commissioner Baker, because you did make those comments about the $500 billion of private investment, um, if, if you can just answer that same question and, and what effects it would have on future investments. So I think it's important what's brought us here, but I also think what's, what's important to take us to the next generation. So updating the networks uh, by 2015, the number is going to be $182 billion. I think the network providers are going to have to have a return on that investment. It's a very tight capital market. I think things like network management, prioritization, specialized services have been turned into um, bad words as opposed to engineering marvels. And I think that we need to allow, I think the term is called um, wealth transfer. And so what we're doing is taking away revenue streams from the providers who are building these networks. They need to have as much incentive as possible to have a return on their investment, which will then in turn allow all of the edge applications to innovate and, and continue this uh, terrific ecosystem. And we heard some concerns in a previous hearing last week about 
uh, that in relation to the stimulus bill where the federal government was using taxpayer money to, in essence, encourage other companies to compete against private companies who already made an investment of billions of dollars, hiring thousands of people, creating good jobs uh, that now will not have that same ability uh, to make those investments in the future. So again, we've seen those regulations killing jobs, and that's, that's a big concern. I know we'll get into more of it in the second round. I appreciate yes, it. And I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to welcome uh, the commissioners here again. I want to begin by saying I agree with you that uh, the uh, Chairman Janikowski, I think, in essence, you said you know, your statement was that regulations don't create incentives, they create certainty, and certainty is a catalyst for investment and innovation. I certainly concur with that, uh, those sentiments. Uh, when the FCC decided to issue a balanced set of open Internet rules, I, for one, urge industry not to challenge these rules in court. Uh, these rules largely track an agreement that this committee helped to negotiate among parties on all sides of the issue. And now that some of these companies have decided to take the route of the court route. This, the question of, FCC, of the FCC authority to adopt rules affecting broadband service providers will unfortunately be uh, left in the hands of uh, the federal appellate court. And to me, um, I, want, I would have liked to avoid that. And I would hope, uh, sincerely hope, that after today, that we in the Congress will move on and move ahead to help you, the FCC, and our nation tackle more immediate problems, including our looming spectrum crunch, finding spectrum four, and financing the build out of and national interoperable public safety network, reforming universal service, and designing auctions and licensing opportunities to ensure that minority and small businesses have just as good a chance as the large uh, fat cats, the large corporation, the big boys, to become real participants and players in the communications and technology sector. And as you know, uh, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Janikowski, the President recently announced that he supports reallocation of the 700 megahertz D block to public safety. Further, both Senator Rockefeller and Representative King have reintroduced bills uh, this year that will reallocate the D block to public safety. Last year, you testified in front of this subcommittee that you believe the plan to auction the D block recommended by the National Broadband Plan provides the best strategy going forward. Now I want to ask each one of you, and I only have a few more minutes, if so if you would quickly answer this question with a yes or no answer. Do you still support the recommendation to often the D block as laid out by the National Broadband Plan? Yes, and we need to get a mobile broadband public safety network built and funded. Commissioner Cobbs? Well, I think that's a viable proposal. I think we uh, also need to hear from, uh, from the Congress on it. The central question to me is which of the options out there are going to provide the money to actually build this uh, infrastructure, and we need to identify where that is, and I think that will be the route to go. I think this issue is more of one of uh, public safety needing more money rather than more spectrum, uh, and I'd like to see the D-Block auctioned off uh, cleanly, uh, but we need Congress's help uh, to uh, fund that build-out. I look forward to a congressional engagement. The, at the bottom uh, of, of this, at the core of all this, is uh, we need uh, the pathway for a truly interoperable public uh, safety network. I think that's what we all want, and the best way to get that, I look forward to engagement from you. I think uh, I agree with all my fellow co commissioners and the chairman. Um, last year, we testified that uh, an auction was a terrific way forward. Um, it seems to be that some other ideas have surfaced from other places, and I think if we're going to look at reallocation, that too is a viable alternative. I think the important thing is to get the public safety interoperability network built as soon as possible, and we'll look to you as to how to do that best. The next question. When FCC auctioned 52 megahertz of spectrum in 2008, uh, 
one of the your predecessor, Chairman Jenikowski, said, it is also appalling that women and minorities were virtually shut out of this option, with women on bidders winning no licenses and minority on bidders winning less than 1% of licenses. <clears throat> we clearly failed to meet our statutory obligation in, 20, in 309J to expand diversity in the provision of spectrum-based uh, services. Uh, we raised about, in, two, in 208, we raised about $20 million for the U.S. Treasury. Much of that spectrum has been now deployed to make 4G services a reality, giving subscribers faster broadband speeds, supporting the new mobile apps uh, ecosystem and mobile video. Many critics of the auctions contended, however, that the FCC's auction design did not do enough to allow women, minority, and rural phone companies to win any of the spectrum licenses. If you decide to auction the D block, what design improvements can the FCC make to ensure that these types of bidders are more successful this time around? Well, you raise an important issue, and uh, we would look at all possibilities to um, uh, uh, address those issues in any auction design when we take up our next auction design. And in connection with the topic of the day, I'll say that the, what, one of the challenges in that area is the amount of capital that's required to build and launch a wireless business is very high, and it's, it's what makes the issue difficult. Um, in the online area, the capital requirements to start a building a, a business are much lower. And so the opportunities for new entrants, diverse entrants uh, on the Internet is something that uh, I think is a promising opportunity. And the gentleman's time has expired. Now I'd like to go to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity. I want to also thank uh, all of you for being here with us today. And. Uh, it's very, very enlightening, um, and uh, what I'd like to kind of do is maybe just kind of start off with, uh, I, I really believe that we've got to keep uh, government out as much as we possibly can, because uh, if we want to see innovation and growth, it's not going to happen from the federal government, it's going to happen back home. And uh, one of the things, Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit for the record today is a letter from a company doing business in my district from Amplex Internet, Internet if I could... Uh, ask unanimous consent that that be included in the record. Without objection. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. And uh, one of the things that's said, and just real quickly about this company, so it's, it's in a village in my district, and they have uh, uh, 2,100 households and businesses they supply uh, uh, service to, and they employ eight people and have added three new employees in the last year, which is how we grow things in America, from small businesses and grow small to grow large. But in his letter, it's interesting because he states a couple of things that uh, I, I think that uh, you might have been in, in your own uh, meeting rooms because this letter was dated December the 15th of last year. And he says in the letter, the Internet has grown incredibly rapidly without significant government regulation and continues to do so. There is no pressing reason for the government to act at this time. He goes on to say, in the limited number of cases to date involving questionable behavior, the existing consumer protection laws have been sufficient to address the issues. And I find that interesting because, you know, one of the things I think we, I'd like to ask this question is from, you know, we've been kind of talking at the 30,000 foot level here today. What we need to do is talk to the people back home on Main Street. These are the folks that have got to do this. And uh, starting uh, with uh, Commissioner McDowell, I tell you, I think that he, he must have been in your uh, computer because when I'm looking at your, your statement for, you entered on December the 21st of 2010, you state on page 6, and my dissent is based on four primary concerns. Nothing has broken the Internet access market that needs fixing. An existing law and Internet governance structures provide ample consumer protection in the event a uh, systematic uh, market failure occurs. Those two letters are just six days off, but this is somebody from Main Street. Again, somebody that's out there trying to, to, uh, to live with this. And uh, I guess I'd also like to, I'm going to ask uh, just something or read something that uh, Commissioner uh, Baker that you'd written in your testimony that uh, saying again that uh, you're, you're, you're pretty much just saying that uh, our, our surveys reveal that 93% of subscribers are happy with their broadband or their broadband service, and that you, you go into that you know that we need broadband competition, you need private capital, 
and that uh, we have to, the Internet is open without the need of affirmative government regulation. So I guess if I could just start uh, uh, with uh, Commissioner McDowell. What do I tell the folks back home? How do I explain what we do here in Washington that affects them right off the bat? Because again, we're looking at, you know, we do things at 30,000 feet, but we're talking about people right at the ground level, ground zero now. Well, I think uh, you touched on an important, important point, which is, excuse me, that we've had wonderful innovation at the edge. The Twitters, the Facebooks, the Ebays, the Amazons have all developed under the current environment that there is no systemic market failure, that nothing, nothing is broken. And when you look around the globe, it's not private sector with the, with the private sector mischief with the Internet that's the problem. It's, uh, it's state control of the Internet. And that, that is the concern here. Uh, but also, I'd like to sort of take issue with the, the notion that's been aired several times that the December 21st order was somehow some act of consensus because Comcast and AT&T and NCTA, Comcast Trade Association, signed onto it. Comcast was very vulnerable had a large merger before the commission at that time. AT&T, it ended up, uh, was uh, bidding on Qualcomm 700 megahertz spectrum, is going to need a SEC approval of that. Uh, and of course, the, uh, those two entities are going to want to uh, comply as best as possible. But when you read uh, their statements, they aren't ringing endorsements. And as we've seen debate over this peering issue as to whether or not the FCC has, is going to claim jurisdiction uh, to, to regulate peering, um, NCTA and AT&T have, have submitted a joint letter to the Commission expressing grave doubts and, and uh, feeling as though there's a bit of a bait and switch here. So, you know, there, there's not great uh, consensus here, and Wall Street analysts aren't part of that as well. Back in October, uh, October 1st of 09, uh, we convened a workshop at the FCC on investment and broadband, and we had back when, back when Title I was being discussed and not just Title II, and we had analysts at cautioning us against net neutrality regulation. Then Title II, the specter of Title II, was aired last year in the middle of the year. And I think what you saw from Wall Street in uh, December was more of a sigh of relief that it was not an overt or an explicit uh, Title II reclassification. Um, in reality, what it is, it's Title II with a Title I disguise, as I've said in my dissent. So that sigh of relief doesn't necessarily equate to Wall Street's endorsement of what the FCC did. Gentleman's time has expired. I, I, I thank you, you back. The chair now recognizes the, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Harmon, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the, uh, the subcommittee for um, years of uh, friendship and um, partnership. Uh, I will miss this subcommittee very much and had been uh, looking forward to uh, my return here. I'll also miss this commission very much. Um, Rob McDowell, thank you for your comments. Others of you, thank you for your notes, some of them quite blunt and humorous, um, which I shall treasure. But uh, I, I, I want you to know that the set of issues that we're addressing this morning are a centerpiece for what will, will or won't keep our country uh, safe, uh, innovative, uh, and uh, free. I do like that word. Uh, in the future. And so let me just turn to my, my top um, um, uh, priority uh, for this subcommittee and the commission. And I've decided that since you all want to give me a, uh, a parting gift, you will act on my top priority, um, which uh, Michael Copps said uh, he wanted to act on this year. That is to build out in some efficient way a national interoperable communications network for first responders. Uh, and oh, by the way, while you're at it, I hope you will also consider uh, some brilliant legislation that uh, Mr. Shimkus and I introduced last year and that I hope he will take the lead on reintroducing this year uh, called the Next Generation Public Safety Device Act, the point of which is to create a real competition for devices to use in this emergency space uh, that will provide uh, the users with uh, much better, um, um, uh, if, uh, much, much better um, uh, performance at a much more uh, competitive price. So having said that, uh, I'd like to ask the commissioners, each of you, um, whether you're ready to give me these wonderful and important national gifts as I depart the Congress. 
Well, we are, if, if, if I may, uh, um, uh, we really are going to miss your leadership uh, uh, on this committee and in Congress, particularly on these issues. Uh, uh, getting a mobile broadband public safety network built is, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's one of, it should be one of the country's top priorities. Um, now, it will require funding to build it. And so we're ready as a commission, I'm, I think this is true of all of us, to work on a bipartisan basis with everyone uh, to support whatever legislation is necessary to move forward. We've begun to move forward on the interoperability piece. We want to be ready. Uh, but you're absolutely right that this is a major challenge for the country. Well, let me just add, uh, Mr. Chairman, that I, I tend to favor the auction concept because I think it will generate funding and it will also push innovation. I think that the private sector has uh, marvelous ideas to offer the public sector, the public safety uh, sector. I would just say there, there are several different ideas that are now in circulation, in debate. They should be discussed, resolved uh, quickly. Here, here. Focus on what gets a mobile broadband public safety network built quickly. Mr. Copps. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the, for the opportunity to, uh, to respond. Your leadership on this, you and I go back a long way in, in fighting on the, for this uh, issue, and I think maybe the time is nigh when we're actually going to get something done. I just sense that there's a, a willingness to, uh, to move ahead. We have to be practical and pragmatic uh, uh, how we do that, uh, but I think, uh, I think this is a year in a bipartisan fashion because it's not a bipartisan issue to get this done. As my Old boss, Senator Fritz Hollings, reminded me many, many times the safety of the people is always the first obligation of the public servant, and uh, you have certainly uh, uh, met that obligation uh, often and well, and uh, uh, I certainly will uh, miss your leadership uh, on this and a whole range of other issues, but uh, certainly uh, look forward to the great work you will do with the Wilson Center and to uh, continuing our friendship uh, after you leave these hallowed halls. Thank you so much. Mr. McDowell. I think an auction is the best way to raise the maximum amount of revenue for the Treasury to help fund this. In the meantime, the FCC has granted waivers to 20 jurisdictions. Uh, so the LA area, the DC area, for instance, are covered in that regard, but uh, great swaths of the country are not. Well, let me just, if, if I might, on those waivers, while I favor that and thank you very much, I worry that we may be building regional uh, interoperable networks that will not be the re regional, yeah, that will not be interoperable nationally, and so it is critical, I think, to have some common uh, rules of the road and also to focus on the devices that are used in these regions. And if I may, we share that concern, and it's why we're working together on interoperability and why we're moving in that proceeding to make sure that we don't end up with that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can the last two uh, uh, witnesses yes. answer my question? Of course. Uh, again, uh, thank you for your service, and I look forward uh, to, to uh, more and, and, and better to come in your new capacity. Uh, I, too, you know, being from a state uh, that is very vulnerable uh, from, a, from a weather perspective, I, I, too, think that this is way overdue, long time coming. Um, while I know you have some concerns about those waivers, those diff waivers give us um, a, kind of, a, a better pathway forward. They let us know in, in very small, you know, very small, relatively small footprint some of the challenges that, uh, that will lie ahead. So uh, that type of flexibility does have its advantages, and I'm looking forward to better and a more robust interoperable system. Uh, I agree with all my colleagues about the comments on your leadership and your advocacy, and I very much hope that your legacy is that we will get this done in the window of opportunity that we have right now while 4G networks are being built out. So thank you. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman, um, but I will look forward to this giant gift of a national interoperable network and a competitive system to develop uh, devices all wrapped up with a bow by December 2011. Would that be all right with you? As long as you stay here on the committee. <laughs> um, I, I appreciate uh, your service on the committee, Ms. Harmon, and, and your service on the Intelligence Committee, too. Uh, you've been a real leader. And we, we will if I you. might, I hope it will be by the anniversary and not December, but by September 2011. Uh, we'll, and we'll have some further discussion about D-Block and broadband plans and money and access and where we go from there uh, before this committee at some point in the not too distant future. But we're going to try and stay on uh, net neutrality today for the most part. Uh, Mr. Kinzinger, we recognize you now for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks for uh, coming out to see us. 
and uh, and all the patience you're having to put in. I know it's not uh, uh, always overly enjoyable to sit there for two and a half hours or more and answer questions. Some of them are the same. So uh, let me uh, just ask a few, kind of express a few concerns I have, ask a couple of questions, and then uh, we'll move on because I don't want to rehash a lot of the old stuff. But let me just say in, in 2003, uh, I think it was 15% of Americans had access to broadband technology. Uh, as of 2010, it's 95%. So as I look over the stretch of just seven years, I see an extreme flourishing of what we see in technology today in just one decade. I mean, when you even look through history, you're going to see that this, I mean, it's just a relatively short period of time. I'm glad. You know, I often wonder if I could go back 15 years or 10 years or whatever to the FCC commissioners and ask them, what do you foresee as challenges and how can you respond to that right now because of these potential challenges that are coming? I actually fear what they may come up with as solutions for what they could potentially see as a challenge that doesn't fully exist yet. That's what I see when I look at the net neutrality issue is, okay, well, we see potentially what could happen, so let's preemptively pass this law without really not passing a law because Congress isn't even approving of this. And it's, it's that. I mean, look, I'm a pilot. That's what I, that was my job before this. I still love flying airplanes. I love the idea that someday we may have flying cars. I think that would be great. We could get around all this traffic. But I don't think it's appropriate for the transportation department to now take a look at when we have flying cars and go ahead and implement rules for when that's going to happen. That's a concern I have. And, you know, beyond the issue, beyond the merits of the issue and all that, where we have a lot of heartburn and where, again, a supermajority of congressmen in the last Congress, the 111th, not even this one where it significantly looks different now, but when a supermajority basically stand up and say, we don't want this or we have concerns about this, where I think the heartburn is not so much in the rule, we can talk about the rule, and, you know, I disagree and all that, but is the fact that the three of the five commissioners felt that you had the authority to go around Congress implementing this rule, knowing that very well, if you think it, it exists on its merits, there can be an effort to, to talk to all of us about the importance of net neutrality and, and we'll be sold on these great merits and we may pass it out of the House of Representatives and you can do whatever you want. But that didn't happen. In fact, I've heard from a few a concern that, well, we think it's going to hold up in court. Okay. You ought to be real sure. Uh, we, we're pretty sure we have the authority to do this. You ought to be real sure you have the authority, and if you don't have the authority to do it, or you're even questioning whether you have the authority, why not come to the people's house and ask for it? If it can stand on its merits, we'll give it to you. So that's my thoughts. And let me ask, uh, and, and this will be basically my final question, so uh, I may give you all mercy and not have to stay here the whole five minutes of my questioning. But as I look through these concerns, and, and right now on the floor of the House of Representatives and for a few weeks going forward, we're going to talk about, actually for a couple years going forward, we're going to talk about budget issues. We're going to talk about how much money this government spent that it doesn't have. Um, you're seeing amendments talking about where we can't spend money and, and all this. That's a very big concern. My question is, how much money, and, and Chairman, I'll ask you this. You may not have the number. I'd love to get it if you do uh, eventually. How much money has this already broke government spent um, in the Comcast versus FCC case? And how much do you see that you will potentially spend in uh, defending the Verizon appeal? And uh, yeah, I'll just ask that. If you have a number of how much money that the government spent that we don't have in defending something that, frankly, the, uh, has been implemented without the authority of Congress. I, I don't have a number, but we will work on, on answering your question. And, and, and to your larger point, which I completely respect, we continue to be available as a resource to work with Congress on legislation that would provide uh, certainty and address issues around broadband. And so that is, that is our job, and we look forward to being a resource to Congress. And, and I hope as new issues come up and new concerns you have, if, if you're questioning whether or not you really do have the explicit authority, that you would uh, take that route. And I, I think all of us on this uh, uh, subcommittee would be happy to work with you in, in, in discussing the, the pros and cons. So uh, at that, I'll, I'll yield back, and I thank you for your Gentleman time. Gentleman yields back his time. We go now to uh, Mr. Towns for five. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and, and the ranking member for holding this hearing. Um, also, let me say to my colleague, Ms. Harmon, we're definitely going to miss her. 
you know, and I'm taking it sort of somewhat personal because I return to the committee and you leave the committee. You know, and so, uh, but we will miss you and then tell you it's been great working with you over the years. Uh, let me um, uh, say, first of all, uh, Commissioner uh, Janikowski, um, I heard your opening statement and you mentioned jobs. And I think that one thing today, more than anything else, is that we need to focus on jobs. I mean, people um, unemployed, many of them have attended the most prestigious universities in this country, but now have no jobs. So let me ask you, how can we bridge the digital divide and encourage great access to technology in economically disadvantaged areas where it is lacking? Uh, with the speed in which technology is developing, what action has the agency taken or plan to take in the future to make sure our, that those left behind by our economy are part of this innovation generation? Yes, well, this you, is Mr. A, Chairman, I go right down the line. Please, just I, very quickly, this is a very significant issue. Uh, there are 24 million Americans who don't have any broadband infrastructure at all, and then there are 100 million Americans, uh, about 33 percent of the population, who haven't adopted broadband. And the number of Americans who don't have basic digital tools and skills and literacy to participate in a digital economy is way too high. Uh, there's no silver bullet uh, to solve this. Uh, we're working on a series of initiatives, uh, some together with other agencies, uh, some looking at our programs uh, that have addressed similar issues in the telephone era. Uh, it's an area where I think there's great opportunity for public-private partnerships because every new uh, subscriber benefits these broadband goals and also benefits uh, uh, the infrastructure companies that are signing people up. Uh, so I acknowledge the importance of this issue and look forward to working with you on it. Thank you very much, because when we leave people behind, it does not make us more competitive. Right. Um, uh, Commissioner Copps. Yeah, thank you very much for, for your question. Uh, you know, there was a time, historically speaking, when one-third of a nation was ill-housed and ill-clad and ill-nourished, and Franklin D. Roosevelt was President of the United States, and we all were very concerned about that. Uh, now we have a situation where one-third of the country are not having uh, access or to being able to take advantage of access to this liberating uh, technology. That should certainly put that uh, put this whole problem at the top of our list, or uh, close to the top of our list of national priorities, and making sure it goes to every American, no matter who they are, where they live, the particular circumstances of their individual lives, white or black, rich or poor, city or country, uh, that's got to be the, the policy. That's the universal service policy we need to design. Thank you very much. And Mr. McDowell, Commissioner McDowell. Yes, sir. Actually, in our work uh, since uh, the chairmanship of Michael Powell on the unlicensed use of the television white spaces, I think is one area where this can be particularly helpful. And uh, Chairman Janikowski deserves great credit for uh, continuing to move that ball down the field. But unlicensed use of this fabulous spectrum uh, will really speed deployment and make things more uh, affordable. Also, it will help uh, be a, you know, a release valve uh, should there ever be sort of anti-competitive uh, behavior in the last mile. You know, this is an antidote to the concerns uh, that uh, net neutrality proponents have. But as with Wi-Fi, we saw, you know, we had, nobody had heard of Wi-Fi on Friday, but by Monday it was everywhere practically. So uh, I think with white spaces, that's going to help uh, tremendously for affordability, uh, access and adoption. Is there anything here we need to do on this side of the aisle? as members of Congress to help move this forward. White spaces in particular? Yes. Well, I, th uh, I think we're, we're good uh, on that as long as we can move forward. Uh, the, I think the spectrum uh, reallocation legislation is causing some concern. I was just telling Congresswoman Eshoo, I was just in Silicon Valley in her district a few weeks ago. And uh, until we know whether or not the incentive auction uh, legislation is going to uh, pass and become law, uh, chip makers and, and software designers uh, are withholding their, uh, their work until they can know how to innovate and how the spectrum is actually going to be used. So the sooner Congress uh, can have resolution one way or the other on the incentive auction idea, I think that would be fabulously helpful. Right. Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you, uh, Congressman. I think about this. I, I, I wrote down three things that came to mind. 
affordability, availability, and education. You touched on those. Uh, one thing that was great about the National Broadband Plan, it has forced us to concentrate on those challenges. The challenge of that 5 percent that was mentioned that is not served right now. Uh, the challenge of, of, of literacy issues which translate into digital literacy um, issues that we, you, you asked how possibly Congress could help. When things get better, I know things are a little tight budgetarily now, we put forth, well, the National Broadband talked about a digital literacy core. Um, that's something that these digital navigators um, could come in these communities to help educate and augment the experiences of people. Availability and, and, and affordability, I know time is, is, is short. Those go in hand in hand and there are a number of things happening. We talked about a, a major transaction that just took place. There are a couple of things that, that are being offered that I hope are replicated. Affordable economy, uh, affordable under $10 a month, high speed internet access that's coming that's possible can be replicated. S support for equipment, which is another barrier to entry, that's an important barrier to entry. A a affordability from that perspective that is coming, that can be replicated. And availability in terms of the infrastructure, the, the things that we could put forward to encourage infrastructure development, that is here now and we look forward to working more with you to encourage that uh, to continue. Very General. encouraging. I know my time has expired, but uh, being I'm new to the committee, can Ms. Baker answer it as well? We'll go ahead and do that. Yeah. Um, I agree with everything that my fellow commissioners have said. Uh, we've we've done relatively well in deployment. We want faster, broader, bigger, better networks to be built. But some of the focus we really need to do is on adoption. The only thing I would add is that we re figured out how to reach consumers for the first time during the digital television transition. And I think if we could revisit some of those public-private partnerships to focus, since it's not a one-size-fits-all problem, that if we can really use those partnerships to focus on bringing more people to the internet as it becomes very much critical infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your generosity. You're you. welcome, Mr. Towns. Now we go to Mr. Rogers from Michigan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, and thank you for your time today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we all know that uh, the uh, Internet regulation uh, in your order regulate, regulates Internet service providers, but how does this impact uh, content providers from disc uh, discriminatory actions? Uh, uh, in, um, are you asking about intellectual property issues on this? Well, you, you, I mean, companies like Google and Skype and other companies are not impacted by your order. I'm just curious if you believe that there's the, the ISPs are conducting some discriminatory, which you claim they're not. Is that correct? It could be. Uh, there have been instances uh, uh, of discriminatory conduct. It, it, okay, but how, so how do you prevent in this order discriminatory conduct be from, uh, for uh, uh, content providers? H historically, uh, this issue, the uh, open internet protections that have been in place since 2005 have been focused on the internet service providers, and, and, and that's for good reason. That's fundamentally where the Communications Act points us to companies I, I understand, that are but this particular order does not impact content correct. providers. Yes? That's correct? Yes. Okay. Um, in your December 21st press release, you dis, uh, described, and I quote, the Internet has thrived because of its freedom and openness. The absence of any gatekeeper blocking lawful uses of the, ne the network or picking winners and losers online, end quote. But I'm, I'm curious, when I read the order, aren't you merely making the government the gatekeeper in this particular case? Uh, none at all. With respect, I, I don't think that's what we're doing. We're simply saying that uh, certain conduct by the companies uh, that do control access to the Internet aren't consistent with Internet freedom and, and, and shouldn't be permitted. And which companies which means you're the gatekeeper because you're the sole determinant of that. Mr. McDowell, you wrote a dissenting opinion that basically, I don't think you used the word gatekeeper, but can you help me understand? I, I clearly believe that's the government is going to make those decisions about who is and who is not on access. Is it, all boils, it all boils down to the word reasonable and how three FCC commissioners will uh, define that term on a case-by-case -case basis. So when we talk about the price tiering, for instance, uh, there are some advocacy groups who uh, have pushed for net neutrality rules who are worried about price tiering as somehow being discriminatory. Um, and it is discriminatory, but not in the bad sense. 
what this actually does, it allows uh, low-income users, for instance, to have uh, a, a price they can afford for, let's say, wireless services provided by Metro PCS. Um, but is that uh, reasonable? Uh, is that uh, uh, that's going to be determined by three FCC commissioners, uh, unelected uh, appointees? And certainly opens the standard. They were talking about applications and the next generation of Facebook, but uh, just because nobody wants to buy my particular product or app, I find it unreasonable that I don't have some unusual access to the Internet. Could, could I bring a case like that to the Commission? I think under the, the logic put forth in the order, the Commission has boundless authority and you could bring uh, such cases. The, the, the Commission basically says it has authority for economic, direct economic and indirect economic regulation, but is choosing not to go to certain places. But it could, it says but in the order. I have met no inter inter, uh, inventor of any application that didn't think that this was the one that should make it. That's why we have thousands and thousands of applications, and I am stunned by these uh, very polite terms of light touch, of regulation. But what we are doing is creating the government as the gatekeeper for the Internet for the first time in its history after it has exploded with innovation. And you use Facebook as your term for the future, but Facebook was there before you got there, and so was Netscape. And so is Google, and so is YouTube, and it explodes, and it's fantastic. And for the government to step in and get the keys to the gate scares me to death. And I will ask you this, Mr. McDowell. Is, was this a controversial order? I mean, given the sense that 300 members of Congress, yes or no? Yes. Have you ever seen in your time, uh, actually I'm going to ask Mr. Copps, you've been there 10 years. Have you ever done such a controver controversial order the week before Christmas? at the change of a Congress when there, there was going to be a power switch in the body. I mean, that's a lot going on, a lot of chaos. This is major. It's controversial. Have you ever seen that in your 10 years on the Commission? Yes, I have. I've seen oh, really? it a couple of times with regard to media ownership, the newspaper broadcast cross-ownership, uh, a number of other things where we were on. So we were in such a hurry that you didn't when feel we you needed a full we market a survey? Yes, sir. Wow. Interesting. And uh, Mrs. Baker, you, you uh, described that the, there, the market surveys before the European Union, not known for its bashfulness about regulating anything if it moves, what was their determination on regulation of the Internet in relation to this? Uh, the European Union took a look at this and actually said what we need to do is have a transparency, a very consumer friendly transparency approach so that if there is a problem there we would be able to address it. So in, in some regards they um, we took a much more regulatory approach than the European Union. Wow. So the French even argued that we were, have gone too far. Well, Interesting. I, would, I see my time has expired. I would look forward to another round of questions. Mr. Now turn to the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Inslee, for five minutes. Thank you. And, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member Eshoo, to allow me to participate this. I think this is very important, and I appreciate the Commission's work uh, on this effort, because I really do believe the Internet does run a risk of becoming the outer net if we don't protect Americans' access to it. Because, and I say outer net because you will be out of luck if your service provider decides that they want you to go to their content provider that they've struck a deal with or they've struck a merger with rather than what you want to go to on the internet. And anyone who doesn't understand that threat doesn't understand the enormous commercial interest in cornering lanes of this freeway. Now, everyone has a metaphor. I'll just tell you how I look at it, in that this is a freeway. And the risk we face is that individual entrepreneurs, out of commercial instinct, will and do control the on lanes to the freeway. Now, I don't know how my Republican colleagues think about it, but I'll tell you if some commercial entity today put down gates on I-5, on the Mercer Street entrance to Interstate 5 in Seattle, Washington, and said you couldn't go past that gate unless you agreed to go to my favored shopping center. I'll just pick Walmart for a minute, not to anything bad about Walmart, instead of Costco, which my competitor has to deal with. And that's the risk we face. We face people putting gates on this freeway if you don't go to my favorite shopping center that I've struck a deal with as a service provider. And I just so I want to thank you for your work on this. But I do want to ask you about some concerns, because I think there's some things we need to continue to explore. And one of them I have a principal interest in is how we prevent this from happening in the wireless space, because we know so much is going to the wireless space. 
And I guess I do have a concern that we have acted in the, in the wired space, which you can think of a little bit as yesterday, but not in the wireless space, which I think of as tomorrow, which is going to be the future of this thing. And I hate to think the thing that we did the right thing in the wired space, but not in the wireless. I just wonder, Mr. Copps and, and, and Mr. Chairman, if you could both address that concern, what the options may be for us. I appreciate it. Well, for my part, I would, uh, I would agree and uh, express some uh, concern about that because in many ways I think wireless is now too. Lots of people are cutting their, uh, uh, their lines and taking to wireless and accessing broadband that way too. Uh, I, I understand that there are differences and when you uh, implement a, a network neutrality uh, rule, you have to be cognizant and sensitive to those uh, uh, differences in how you proceed, but I think the principle should apply and the rule generally should have uh, 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 should have applied. If I could just say one more thing real quickly, I really appreciated your uh, illustration of the uh, uh, I-5 uh, example that she used because I was sitting here thinking uh, during much of the discussion the last great infrastructure build out that this country had was the interstate highway system and we made darn sure there were on ramps and that they were open and all of this talk about oh it's perspective and all uh, we put uh, safety precautions on there prospectively. We put speed limits on there prospectively. There's nothing wrong with doing things prospectively, particularly when you're talking about safeguarding such a transformative uh, infrastructure as we're talking about here. Well, I would just add that uh, 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 agree that the importance of mobile access to the Internet is growing uh, every day. Uh, in the order we adopted, um, we did take steps to promote Internet freedom. The transparency uh, provisions, uh, no blocking. Um, we also wanted to be cognizant about some of the differences between uh, wireless and fixed, and it's something that we'll continue to pay attention to and um, uh, 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 do what we can to make sure that Internet freedom is protected uh, on mobile Internet access as well as fixed. Well, there may be some challenges in wireless, but I hope you all will consider them because we hate to create a safety system for the horse and buggy day, but not for the, the car day, and I think that's kind of the transition we're in there. Just any of the other commissioners, if you'd like to comment, feel free. Yes, Congressman. I, I too, um, uh, do not want the development of two separate words, worlds, one wired and, and one wireless. Increasingly, individuals are cutting the cord, as, as my colleague said, is approaching 30 percent, especially in communities uh, that might have economic challenges that have to choose which direction to go. And, 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 and interestingly enough, uh, certain communities you only access the Internet because this is an only affordable means uh, with these mobile devices. So it is important that there, there are experiences as robust as those are in the wired world, and I share your concerns. And uh, uh, again, um, there is no presumption uh, that, uh, that uh, these open Internet rules do not apply. They do apply in this space. Gentleman's time is. Oh, go ahead and finish. Well, I was going to say that this isn't really a question of politics or philosophy. It's actually a question of physics, and then there are actual technical parameters that justify this decision. Um, none of us want, uh, you know, consumers are the ones that don't benefit if their phones don't work. I got into a cab the other day. He was streaming CNN um, on his iPhone, which I thought was really great. And then I thought, actually, you're the reason why I can't make a phone call. So I think that there are technical parameters that we need to work with that actually exist in the wireless world that justify this distinction. Thank you. Gentlemen's time's expired. We'll now go to the gentleman from New Hampshire, Mr. Bass, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I had the honor of serving in this body for 12 years and on this committee for six and now as a returning member of Congress, I am learning a lot as a new freshman. One thing I learned today is don't be late to the beginning of a subcommittee hearing. <laughs> Make note. We are hitting exactly three hours now. And uh, to, the, to the credit of the chair of the committee and the subcommittee chair, we, that's without opening statements. It's a very interesting debate that we're having here today. Uh, I sir, uh, my ancestors, have lived in southern New Hampshire for many, many generations. We have correspondence between my great-grandmother and the Keene Coal Company trying to figure out a way to run an electric line and um, 
well, an electric line for, and a phone line, actually, from, uh, later from Keene over to Peterborough. There was nothing there. And so when we developed the utilities that we have today, they were done because there was no other way for that build-out to occur. We, had, we did not get rotary dial in my hometown until 1964. Um, and the, you had to sneak another phone into your house, hoping that somehow the Ma Bell wouldn't be able to tell that you were doing this. This was, this was a world of enormous regulation, and there was good justification for that. And I understand that the nature of this debate basically surrounds the issue of free markets and, and differing, uh, differing defer, definitions of what freedom is, in what context it belongs. And I am solidly on the side of those who believe that it is a dangerous precedent to begin a whole new round of regulation for very different reasons, in my opinion, from those which we had in earlier days when the utility business was just getting established, rail, electricity, and telecommunications. Now, having said that, um, Mr. Chairman, if I could ask for unanimous consent to add to the record a paper I have here by former Solicitor General Seth Waxman stating that Internet access service was never regulated as a telecommunications service. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, uh, by the way, thank you for coming to visit me and also Commissioner Clyburn, and I believe one of the other ones of you came as well, but I was un not here, and I'm most apologetic for that, and I welcome you all to come. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, some individuals continue to claim that the retail provision of Internet access service was once regulated as a telecommunications service. My understanding is that the FCC has never regulated such service. Wasn't this the genius that led to the explosive growth in the Internet, as Chairman Kennard pointed out when he led the Commission? Absolutely. In fact, if you look at the back of my dissent, you'll see a letter that I filed with uh, this committee uh, last spring uh, outlining sort of the history of the regulation of uh, Internet access services and broadband in particular, and it has never been regulated as a phone company under Title II. Um, Commissioner McDowell, uh, the order that we've been debating this morning claims that network neutrality is needed to protect small upstart Internet companies, but aren't small upstarts precisely the companies that might want to enter into specialized business arrangements with broadband providers so that they can compete against the great content providers? We know who they are. And ironically, is it possible that this order might protect the web incumbents in the end? Uh, it could. I think this order creates a lot of confusion in the marketplace, and we're seeing, seeing the market respond in a lot of confusing ways. And lastly, Commissioner McDowell, uh, the Commission's jurisdiction seems to be evolving. While the Commission has deregulated in certain areas, unbundling, CAM, ARMIS, reporting, cable price regulation, the agency has opposed or at least proposed regulations in new areas, which we debated this morning, network neutrality, all vid, data roaming. Uh, what do you view as the Commission's core responsibilities? And I, I know this is a leading question. Have, have in, your, in your view, the Commission strayed from those core uh, responsibilities? Well, our core responsibility is by statute is given to us by Congress, and that's to uh, protect the public interest. And I think that the public interest is best served uh, through competition. So as Commissioner Baker pointed out earlier, uh, the best antidote to regulation is to have more last mile competition for broadband services. And in my four and a half years on the Commission, that's what I've worked towards, whether it's making it easier to get competitive fiber in the ground, freeing up more of the airwaves for uh, either licensed or unlicensed use, et cetera. Let's have more competition, and that obviates the need for regulation. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, time's expired. We'll go into round two now, and I'll lead with that. Uh, Chairman Janikowski, did you or any of your staff or any senior FCC officials explicitly or implicitly indicate to any members of industry that if they oppose your order, uh, the FCC might move back to Title II approach or decide other proceedings of interest to them differently? No. Okay. Uh, Chairman, uh, have you adopted industry-wide, uh, you, you have adopted industry-wide net neutrality rules. Why was it appropriate to add network neutrality conditions to the Comcast NBC Universal order? And if you're so confident of your authority, 
uh, which we question, obviously. Why was it necessary to make those conditions continue to apply even if the network neutrality decision is overturned in court? All the conditions in the Comcast case, particularly that one, were transaction specific. That particular transaction involved the country's largest Internet service provider combining with a very large uh, content company. Uh, we certainly had uh, a lot of information in the record of that transaction about uh, the incentives to favor their own online content and disfavor others. Uh, and so having a condition relating to uh, open Internet was a transaction specific condition that uh, I personally felt was very important. So I, I get back to something that the Chairman Emeritus, uh, Mr. Dingell, uh, referenced his words, speaking of uh, bank holdup methods. I, look, I was a licensee for 22 years. The last thing you ever want to do is poke any of you in the eye because you might have another proceeding coming. And, and I've spoken to all, I think, most of you directly about my concern about agencies that use that opportunity to affect policy over which they don't have, uh, we believe, authority. And I, I find it interesting, too, that on the D-Block discussion, um, you've chosen to back off on doing what the law explicitly calls on you to do, which is auction the D-Block because Senator Rockefeller and others have expressed concern. In this area, roughly 300 members of the House said, we don't think you have the authority, but you chose to move forward on that rather uh, expeditiously uh, at the closure of the year. So that's a subject that we'll uh, continue to be of concern and, and focus on. I, I want to go back to the Section 706 issue, upon which, uh, is my understanding, you've based the decision to move forward with the net neutrality rules. And in, in 706B, in the inquiry portion of that, the, the question arises if the Commission shall determine whether advanced telecommunication capability is being deployed to all Americans in a reasonable and timely fashion. And I suppose the debate here is what's reasonable and what's timely. Um, in, in the FCC broadband plan that you put forward, uh, you indicate that 95 percent of Americans have access to the Internet. The President now calls for 98 percent. And two-thirds of Americans choose to subscribe and we've gone from 8 million subscribers to 200 million subscribers in 10 years. I can't think of a service in America that's ever exploded with, with growth quite like that. And uh, that would seem to be both timely and reasonable to me. Why isn't it timely and reasonable to you all? Well, I, I think this is an important question. I'm, I'm glad you asked it. There are 24 million Americans who don't have any access to Internet because there's no infrastructure in their areas. And, uh, as you mentioned, there are about 100 million Americans uh, who don't subscribe for various mm -hmm. reasons. Um, our rankings internationally are not where they should be. Uh, there's debate about what exactly the number right, is. Right, but, but we're, we're not building out one. wireless, and we're ahead of some countries on that. And but but I, I, I would say, and we might respectfully disagree on this, I, I don't think the country uh, is where it should be when it comes to broadband, and we have a lot of work to do to make sure our broadband right. infrastructure and adoption is globally competitive. But the issue that arises is as a result of making that finding that we're not moving reasonably and uh, in a timely manner. That is the predicate then that allowed you to trigger 706 and use that as the, the crutch to get the authority to move forward with the regulation of uh, net neutrality, in part. Yes, there are other provisions that we relied on that I'd be happy to address. But then, then it leads to the discussion because in 706A it does talk about allowing state commissions to actually set price caps and all that. Now, I've heard today, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that you, your order does not get into setting uh, rates or controlling rates on the right. Internet. And yet in, in, on page 39, uh, number 67, and on page 43, number 76, you do contemplate rate control by saying that, that you can't pay for priority. Isn't that a form of rate control? I, I, don't think, I don't see it that way, and I don't think that's how people in the industry see it. But, uh, but, but it is the case that um, uh, that that kind of prioritization is something that the order said was disfavored. So it is about, I mean, that, so if you say it's disfavored, that says you believe you have the, con the authority to control rates on the Internet. I, I, really, Correct? I really don't see it that way. Then how could you find that it's uh, that I, it's I think it's disfavor? fair to say that, um, uh, that any order in this area that finds certain conduct inconsistent right. with Internet freedom uh, principles would have the effect of saying particular transactions uh, aren't permitted. And one could look at that and say, well, you're saying that can't, that transaction. Well, but you're saying a rate of zero. Uh, a rate of zero is a rate. 
Yes, and, pay, and, and that's been the history of the Internet. And, and another commission could come back and say, well, we think because all this has been found in part linked to 706B, that indeed you have 706A authority to set caps, couldn't they? I mean, you don't have that plan, you tell us, but... I, there would, uh, if I could make a couple of points. One is the basis for, the for this decision uh, was both in 706, other sections of the statute working together, and so we didn't address the question of whether 706 uh, alone would um, be sufficient authority. Uh, and we didn't address some of the questions that you're raising because we didn't have to in the context of this proceeding. And the uh, ranking member explains to me I'm over my time. So <laughs> I will stop with that, even though I've let other members go over their time to get your responses. I will now turn to the ranking member, my friend. Dear gentlemen, and I think that I'm going to have to really stay within my time for having whispered that to you. Um, first of all, uh, the term uh, uh, cops on the beat have been used um, uh, has been used several times, and I think the best cop on the beat is Commissioner Copps. He has been there for the American people and the consumer, and in the deepest, broadest way, understanding um, the democratization of the Internet and, uh, and protecting the American people uh, from forces that would chip away at it. So I salute you, sir. And, um, uh, I, I wanted to say that I want to make a couple of observations because now we have just about uh, concluded uh, the hearing. Um, it's, it's, there are some curious things uh, 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 that have been advanced uh, during this hearing. Um, my Republican friends have, um, are uh, questioning having any kind of framework. Um, I think it's a light framework. Uh, that's been questioned, but that's my view. I think it's a light touch. Um, uh, and they don't want um, any of that. In fact, I think are going to be introducing the uh, Congressional Review Act uh, so that there is nothing, uh, so that it's just a flat earth without anything on it whatsoever. Uh, but they are in denial about the past. There is a record from the past. There is a record from the past. And there's a timeline. It goes from 2005 to, uh, to this year, to 2011, starting with the Madison River Communications blocking VoIP on its DSL network, settled by FCC consent decree that included a $15,000 payment, to 2006, where Singular uh, blocked uh, PayPal, 2000, 2007, 2008, Comp, uh, Comcast initially denies and then admits after FCC complaint filed that it blocked peer-to-peer -peer traffic. Uh, 2008 uh, issues uh, in a study finding significant blocking of bit uh, torrent in the United States, including across Comcast and Cox. So you can go through the record. These things actually occurred. This is not in the ether. This is not something that's been uh, fabricated. There is a record of violations. And you know who those violations are against? All of us. All of us and our constituents. So our first obligation is to the public. And if there is some misplay, uh, including any company that's in my district, you know what? There has to be a cop on the beat. Not someone that takes out their stick and clubs someone, but there have to be rules to the road. Now, if you ignore the past, then you don't have a road map for the future. And I think that it is very important uh, to, um, uh, to have uh, uh, these rules. Now, another curiosity of mine uh, is uh, about uh, uh, our, um, and you know how much respect and regard I have for you, uh, Commissioners McDowell and Baker um, had the opportunity to remove the open internet conditions on the Comcast merger before they voted. But they chose not to dissent or object, as far as I know. Can I clarify so you, that? Uh, just a minute, let me finish. I'm going to use my time. So you essentially, you voted against them before voting for them, which is a real curiosity to me. Now, um, there's a lot of talk about 
markets and companies and whatever here today. Um, a good number of them are my constituents. I want to uh, uh, ask for a unanimous consent request that all of these letters representing the companies, the interests, the very interests that are uh, a, a part of this decision that have weighed in and support these rules. And they are also opposed to the CRA. And in this packet, which I love, um, the first one is from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. They even quote the Pope. So uh, if I might, for the record, say, I think we're on the side of the angels here. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, with all seriousness, uh, I'd really like to um, uh, ask for a unanimous consent request that all of these letters be pl uh, placed in the record. They are internet companies, they are small, they are large, they are in between, and they have weighed in. No one has forced them to come forward and express uh, any given view. They have offered this, and I think it's an eloquent statement about how they view it and uh, uh, that this uh, is something that they agree with. So uh, if you would grant that Without request. Without objection. And then I have, uh, um, I think I've run out of time, so I can't uh, ask any questions. But, uh, uh, but if uh, you but want to allow Mr. McDowell uh, to respond, for the record, that's fine. And uh, uh, I'm so glad that we're on the side of the angels, and I thank the Catholic Conference of Bishops along with all the companies. Thank did, you. Did you want to allow Mr. McDowell to respond? I'm sure. Happy to give him the time. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, yeah, the, why did you vote that way? <laughs> so um, we didn't vote for the conditions. Actually, the net neutrality is not a condition in the merger. They are uh, part of a side agreement. There are, there are commitments in a side agreement between the chairman's office well, and Comcast, uh, which they deem to be Well, aren't there open internet rules as part They're of the merger? They're not as part of the They are not merger conditions. Right. No, ma'am. But they were voluntary. If I could. I mean, you could have objected a, to them a, if you thought they were so onerous. They are, they are uh, in a separate side agreement between Comcast and the FCC. Did you ever ask them why they would, since you find them to be onerous, why they would find them to be acceptable? Did you ever question it? Absolutely. I think they were desperate to get their merger done, and they would have agreed to almost so everything. So did you ask them yes. why they were? And, and th are that's you pretty quoting much the them? answer I got. They're desperate to get their merger done. Are you quoting them? That's a paraphrase. <laughs> well, I think there's a difference, with all due respect. Uh, because I, I, I don't think that uh, uh, it's not the way it was uh, presented to me. Yes, Commissioner Baker. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think that there are, uh, well, there are absolutely serious legal differences between conditions to the merger and voluntary commitments that a company can make. There's a package of voluntary commitments. Some of them have to do with diversity. This is one that's a voluntary commitment that a company can make without regard to what the FCC has jurisdiction over. So by their commitment, it doesn't, it doesn't imply imply anything to our statutory authority over net neutrality. All right. I'm going to have to. Thank you. Uh, well, we're two and a half minutes over 2.15. Let's go now to uh, the, the chairman of the Oversight Committee and the former chairman of this committee, Mr. Stearns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I regret, as you pointed out, uh, from being here, we are chairing an oversight uh, committee looking into Obamacare. Uh -huh. And so I just have a question. I'd like to start with the chairman, just go down the line, if I could. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Um, you obviously succeeded in uh, putting net neutrality into Title I, but as I understand, the, um, the proceedings are still open for Title II. Is that correct? Uh, there's a proceeding that's open that looks at the effect of the Comcast decision on our authority. Okay. But I think in the industry, the perception is that the proceedings to perhaps do this in Title II is still there. And so uh, my question is, do you think it should be closed down, this proceeding that you have open in Title II? Just yes or no? Uh, I don't think there's any confusion about where we are. It's Title no, I. I mean, in your opinion, do you want to, you think it should remain open? I think a proceeding not? to continue to have input about our authority is a healthy okay. thing. And Mr. Cops, uh, Commissioner Cops, do you think it should be, continue to have the proceedings open for Title II? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, Mr. McNow? I think it should be closed because I think the fact that it's open creates uncertainty and shows that perhaps the Commission wants to move to a full explicit Title II uh, reclassification. Commissioner Clyburn? I think I don't know how to use a mic. I'm sorry. I think that, uh, that we should uh, stay on this pathway and that um, there is certainty um, as with the decision that we made. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Baker? If the Chairman is serious that we are going to stay with Title I, then he should close Title II proceeding. 
Well, I think that's my point, Mr. Chairman. I, I think, as you'll agree with me, by keeping this open, it's sort of a veiled threat for industry and creates uncertainty and gives angst to them because, you know, things could change and this proceeding still open. So uh, I think certainly my position is if you have made your case for Title I, then the proceedings should be closed for Title II. And uh, I just think a lot of us are a little concerned that it is creating angst in the, uh, in the business environment. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, um, I think in terms of when they were talking about uh, issuing in Title I, there was some language that we don't want to get involved with regulating coffee shops and bookstores. But if you actually implement a net neutrality, aren't you in effect regulating the internet in Starbucks? by doing that? Well, as I said before earlier today, there doesn't seem to be any limiting principle to uh, the FCC's authority under its rule, under its order from December 21st. So if there's no limit to its authority, there's no limit to its authority. Yeah, so it could be in bookstores, it could be in coffee shop, anywhere there's Wi-Fi. Wouldn't you agree? Um, so um, let me just go back to this Title II. Uh, the Chairman's indicated that this D.C. Circus ruling in the Comcast case. Um, Mr. Chairman, is it possible, I mean, you've indicated that you want to keep it open because of the Comcast case ruling. You might want to elaborate. I'll give you a chance to elaborate on that to give it more justification because you see the two Republicans that say we should close it down. My opinion, you're creating uncertainty. If you went ahead and did it in Title I, there's no reason to continue to go forward. In fact, uh, I think the chairman of this committee is, would like you to let this committee have the jurisdiction instead of you unilaterally doing it. And I think you've, you've indicated to me you would like to see us provide that direction. Is that true? I mean, yes, ultimately? Yes, we'd, we'd be uh, the, the, the single best way to have clarity and certainty here would be for Congress uh, to look at the statute, uh, update it uh, in a way that was uh, uh, appropriate. There are issues that have been raised. Uh, we certainly would be a resource to that. We were supportive of uh, uh, efforts that have occurred over time to uh, to cause that to happen, and I, I, I would continue to work with that. So um, under what circumstances would you close down the open proceedings under Title II? Um, I'd have to think about that and get back to you, but, but let me explain. It's not a Title II proceeding. It was a, a neutral proceeding that was launched after the Comcast decision to ask questions about our authority in different uh, directions that could be gone, all presented in a neutral way. Uh, uh, as the authority issue continues to be debated, having a proceeding open that's a vehicle for comment uh, seems to me to make sense. I would be happy to uh, 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 agree to stop debating the authority issue and, uh, and, and put that off to one side. Uh, but again, I think we made our position very clear. I made my position very clear in the order in this case that our basis for moving forward under Title I uh, is strong, uh, and that is a preferable way to proceed. Okay. Any other commissioners like to comment on this? Mr. Copps? Yeah, I, want, uh, I would like to keep that uh, proceeding open while un there is uncertainty, and there is uncertainty right now with uh, how the courts uh, are going to decide. So I don't see any reason why that, uh, uh, that should be closed. I want to keep it open because I think uh, there is probably a more solid foundation, which you and I would disagree on, on Title II. The third thing I want to say is uh, uh, address this idea that uh, a bunch of bureaucrats has end run the uh, wishes of the Congress. I worked in the United States Senate for 15 years. I'm kind of a creature of the Congress. I take great pride in the service that I had here. I uh, voted as I did on all these things because I think I am upholding and implementing the laws that Congress passed. And I, I passionately believe in, uh, in what I've said here today, but uh, I don't want to leave any impression that uh, I'm at any odds with the wishes of uh, Congress, or at least how I see the wishes of Congress. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time. Unless any one of the commissioners want to add something, I'm done. Thank you for your time. I, I would just like to add that I, I think the, the Title II docket, call it what you will, uh, it, given the context of when it was opened in June of last year, in the wake of the Comcast uh, court case, um, and given the uh, so-called the, the announcement of the so-called third way proposal, which was a Title II proposal, um, that it remains open, uh, it seems, as a contingency plan should the courts, or in my view, when the courts strike down the FCC December 21st order uh, under Title I. Uh, and so uh, there was plenty of certainty in this marketplace until the FCC started examining 
uh, regulating it. All right. Uh, gentleman, time expired. Let's go now to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, for five minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, I just wanted to revisit something that um, you said at the end of uh, your comment when we talked about the stimulus bill and you said if Congress uh, you know, wanted us to do implement these rules, we should have acted. And um, you know, in fact, we, we did uh, the Recovery Act actually required that. I just wanted to read a section from it. It says um, that um, pursuant to this section, the Assistant Secretary shall, in coordination with the Commission, Published the non discrimination and network interconnection obligations that shall be contractual conditions of the grants awarded under this section, including at a minimum adherence to the principles contained in the Commission's broadband policy statement. So I, I think at some point Congress did indicate that, that we wanted you to move in that direction. Um, but I want to ask Chairman Jenikowski now, we've heard a lot of our colleagues on, on the Republican side of the aisle suggest that uh, the process that you used in the merger and, and uh, also in this uh, open Internet proceeding were unusual and, and perhaps inappropriate. And I want to give you the opportunity to share your thoughts on, on those suggestions. Uh, how did the process you used differ from past proceedings? Well, I think in, in, in both of those proceedings, we met or exceeded best practices in the area. And so to start with our open Internet proceeding, uh, we launched with a notice last year that published the rules, which was a positive departure from prior precedent. Uh, we received uh, uh, over 200,000 commenters. We held public workshops available offline and online that a number of commissioners, including those who disagreed with the direction, participated in to make it open. We issued requests for further comment as we drilled down on particular uh, issues. Uh, uh, and, uh, and ultimately, we exercised our judgment and interpreted the will of Congress and made a decision. Um, uh, uh, with respect to the Comcast order, uh, we inherited a situation where in past transactions there were just enormous complaints uh, about the length of time far longer than this took uh, about a proceeding that was, uh, well, let me just say it in a positive way. We ran a proceeding that was uh, professional, that was focused, uh, that specified the issues that we were concerned about coming out of a complex uh, and large transaction. Uh, and. Um, uh, for those who say that uh, uh, the parties uh, uh, acted a certain way uh, in advance, uh, which I don't believe, uh, and they participated in proceedings up here in Congress uh, and, said the similar, and said similar things, and so did other parties, uh, after the transaction was over and they could have said anything they wanted, they praised the proceeding as uh, fair, timely, and thorough. And, and we, we hear that uh, two of the commissioners didn't get the... Uh the order in, until 24 hours before. Tell me, what's, how does a typical FEC order move forward? Are, 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 dis are, are dissenting commissioners part of the negotiation process? And when did commissioners... Well, uh, consistent with our, our practice, which is also a best practice, three weeks in advance of a commission meeting, we circulate a draft uh, of an order to be voted on. And that kicks off a process of deliberation among uh, commissioners. and. Certainly, it's my hope in that setting that everyone will reserve judgment until there was a chance for full discussion. Uh, in this case, uh, unfortunately, I think two of the commissioners decided within 12 hours that uh, there was nothing to deliberate about or talk about and uh, announced that they would dissent. Um, uh, but there continued to be uh, ongoing uh, discussions. There were further drafts circulated. As we got closer to the meeting, obviously, we needed to circulate a draft that had the support of three members. Uh, I would have been happy, as I think all of us would have been, to circulate that as soon as there was agreement of at least three members. That agreement occurred uh, on uh, uh, the Monday, the day before the meeting. And as quickly as possible uh, after that, we circulated that to the uh, full commission. Um, uh, we took steps to make sure that if there were any prejudice from that, uh, perfecting a dissent, for example, that the commissioners would have the time that they needed uh, to address any issues that came up. But there weren't material differences between uh, what was circulated then and what had been circulated earlier. Thank you. I don't have any other questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I would go then to the gentleman from Texas, the uh, Chairman Emeritus, uh, Mr. Barton, for five Thank you. Um, I said earlier I was impressed with the intellect of the Commission. I must also add to I'm, I'm impressed with their bladders. I think you have all <laughs> been here for three and a half hours continuously, so that's quite a compliment. Um, I want to look at the Title II issue a little bit in this round. Uh, my understanding is that Title II uh, regulates uh, 
hardline monopolistic phone service that we like we had back in the um, 1930s through the 1960s, I'm puzzled why we think that that model would be applied to uh, the internet where we have multiple providers, we obviously have a market that functions, we have multiple options for individuals to choose, the courts have ruled that it's an information service. Uh, I just don't see the connection. Um, Commissioner Baker, can you enlighten me on how I'm wrong when I look at Title II and I see a different system entirely than what we have in terms of the Internet? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, I think you're entirely right. I think it was a contrived way to construe that we might have greater authority, um, which we don't have. What about you, Mr. McDowell? Commissioner McDowell, I should say. Uh, this, as you point out, this was uh, created in 1934, the old circuit switched analog voice mobile monopoly, and actually those rules were taken from the 19th century railroad monopoly uh, regulations. So I don't think uh, it fits the architecture of the Internet, which really defies uh, top-down authoritarian control. So I, I think uh, it, would, it would be a mismatch. Well, to be fair, I should give the chairman, I guess, an opportunity here. Um, chairman Janikowski, what's wrong with, with my analysis of um, Title II? Well, as you know, uh, uh, we decided, and I believe that uh, proceeding under Title I was the right way to go. Uh, the only note that I would make in this discussion is that the, uh, uh, no one at the Commission had suggested a full-blown uh, 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 Title II approach. Um, there was an approach... The gentleman to your left said well, let me, you preferred I, I, it. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I never... I, let me... Uh, um, uh, 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 some suggested um, that the Title II mechanism that was used uh, and is used for mobile voice uh, could make sense, but we listened, uh, we looked at the record, uh, we got input from Congress and others, uh, and decided to pursue a Title I direction. Okay. And I'm not going to ask Commissioner Copps, <laughs> because he has already pointed out he spent 15 years in the Senate, and he, um, he could certainly filibuster that question for the next two minutes of my <laughs> time, but I will give him an opportunity in writing to respond. I want to I want to go to Commissioner Baker for my last question. This is a uh, question that the staff has prepared. It just goes to show that sometimes I can take direction here. Um, Commissioner Baker, uh, the order that we're discussing today, uh, the net neutrality order, relies on Section 706 for authority. Isn't Section 706 about removing barriers to infrastructure investment, and won't network neutrality rules deter investment? And hasn't the FCC in the past said that Section 706 is not an independent grant of authority? Well done. <laughs> yes, Mr. Chairman. I can read. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I think that this in, is an attempt to twist a 14-year-old deregulatory um, policy statement into a direct grant of authority. And 706 does not constitute an independent grant of authority. Section 706 is about broadband deployment. And section, the FCC has no authority to erect obstacles in the name of removing them. So I think that it, we, have, we have completely um, misguided basing our authority here on 706. Um, you have to keep in mind that Section 706 is really the centerpiece of all broadband and Internet regulation going forward was actually a footnote in the 1996 Act. So um, this is an odd place for us to hang our hat on such a important and intrusive regulatory change. Okay. This, Mr. Just, Chairman, if I'm going to yield the time to the distinguished you're kind. chair. I, would the, would the, I don't know if this even requires unanimous consent, but I'll ask for it. We have a vote on the floor. And what I was thinking was if we did two, two, and two, that's we get three members here, uh, we could get everybody in who stayed around. And one, then one, uh, one and one. Yeah. <laughs> if you can do less than that, do it. Over here, they don't want to talk to them. Yeah, one minute for a question, one minute for an answer, there, I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Make it 20 seconds on the question. I recognize the, the, oh, the vice chair. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, and I'm going to read it, but I actually wrote this question. <laughs> uh, today, the broadband provider's business model offers tiers based on speed and size. For example, 7 megabits is uh, less costly than the... 10, 15, or 20 megabit uh, package or tier. 
Uh, so the question is, is a tiered system of size and speed unreasonable discrimination? The answer is no. We, the answer is no. We said so in the order, and it was one of the ways that we brought certainty to the area and uh, will boost uh, investment in infrastructure. Does anybody else uh, want to comment on that? I think it gets uh, contradicted in the order by the ban on paid prioritization. So if you're a consumer and you want a burst of speed to download a movie, a movie, and you don't want to pay 24 by 7 for a big, fat broadband pipe, right, that's not cost effective, would that order prohibit that? Is that a form of tiering? Paid prioritization. It gets confusing very quickly. Okay. Uh, Thank I'd, you. I'd agree. Oh. Our regulation was Mission. kind of clear as mud of that. So why don't you, why don't you bring a declaratory ruling proceeding at the FCC and we can decide? <laughs> I'm being sarcastic. Remember all that micro I'm being sarcastic, trend, but I trend think that there micro are an awful lot of applications. What's the Kindle? What's the Garmin? What's Google Voice and the next generation of the Facebook? Uh, what, what are these items? Are they okay? Uh, I think the answer from our ruling is that you can either bring a complaint process or you can bring in a declaratory ruling and we can tell you whether it's okay. Interesting. All right. We're going to go down to the gentlewoman for Tennessee for no more than two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to go back to where I was with Ms. Clyburn in the first uh, round of hearings. And it is frustrating to us when you all mention that you have done market analysis, but then there is not market analysis that would meet the OMB standards. You cannot point to a market failure. And that is frustrating. So if there is analysis that you want to submit to show how you came to these conclusions, I think that it would be important to do so. Um, Chairman the, the chairman has committed to do that. Okay, thank you. And I apologize, we've had multiple hearings going on this morning. Mr. Chairman, you and I were out at CES last month. And I know you walked the same floor I walked. You talked to a lot of those innovators. And a lot of those guys were out of Tennessee. They're working on health IT. They're working on digital music platforms. They're working on content distribution. AOL is moving their content headquarters into Nashville. Now, what I'm hearing from a lot of these innovators at home and when I'm out and about is, hey, what's this business about having to seek permission from the FCC? Are we going to have to go to them before we innovate? What's the chairman expecting us to do? Are they going to tie our hands? What's this about anybody can object? Um, they can go file a complaint while we're in the innovative process. This is the type uncertainty that stifles job creation. And Mr. Chairman, I don't know if anybody has submitted this Phoenix study uh, for the record, but I think it is excellent. When we talk about Without uh, objection. Uh, models that, uh, that show the, how many jobs are created, uh, indirect lo job losses to this, 327,600 jobs, uh, this is serious because we want to get busy with jobs. I would like for you, Mr. Chairman, to outline for me and submit, for the record, what do our innovators expect? What's this asking permission process going to be? Are they going to have to file? Uh, you can submit it for writing. I know we're short on time. Yeah, we, we'll and just submit please. it for the record as a written right. statement. And I appreciate that you all have come and come prepared. Thank you. May I have 10 seconds for Ten reply seconds. to that? Uh, very quickly, the, uh, uh, just to be clear to the audience, uh, uh, the purpose of the order is to protect innovation without permission. And so no one has to come to the FCC for permission. And the Consumer Electronics Association supported uh, uh, open internet and supported uh, our order. And I'd, be, I'd look forward to continuing this dialogue with you because it is very important. Now we go to Mr. Scalise for no more than two. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll hit the lightning round. Um, Chairman Janikowski on the open internet order. Uh, the FCC stated, for a number of reasons, these rules apply only to the provision of broadband internet access service and not to edge provider activities. Uh, are there no concerns about search engines or online video provider contents that they're doing anything improperly? Well, the, the reason they were the left out. The of this issue has been focused on internet service uh, providers, uh, and that uh, uh, makes sense, particularly given the Communications Act, which focuses our authority on companies that are providing communication services by wire or spectrum. Right, but we've seen, you know, and then there are real examples that have been reported widely in the media. For example, Google Street View, where, where major privacy violations occurred, uh, and yet they're exempted from this, and 
you know, it gives the impression I, that people feel like that, that y'all are picking winners and losers. Uh, and, and that's another whole set of, of problems that people have. Just on that to say, with respect to any company uh, uh, like that that uses spectrum or uh, infrastructure that's in our oversight purview, uh, we will investigate, we will act, uh, regardless of company. The point of the proceeding uh, was to make sure that the market and consumers pick winners and losers, not Thanks. the government. Uh, Chairman, uh, Commissioner McDonald, McDowell, uh, on, on, when it comes to the, these these language uh, provisions that were put in prohibiting providers from taking, quote, reasonable efforts uh, to address things like, uh, or nothing prohibits providers from uh, taking reasonable efforts to address copyright infringements or other unlawful activity. A lot of people are expressing concern that there is no real definition of reasonable effort, and there may be uh, some concern uh, that as, as these uh, broadband providers try to protect their uh, their network from things like cyber attacks, that they might also be concerned that the FCC is going to come behind and fine them because this reasonable effort is, is undescribed. Can you address that? Well, again, that would have to be addressed through litigation, and that's uh, part of the concern. Uh, the word reasonable is perhaps the most litigated word in American history, and uh, so no. that will be determined by three votes. And I know that creates a lot of uncertainty as we talk about the things that we want to see to encourage investment, to encourage job creation. It's those exact types of uncertainties that make it hard for people to make that investment. And, Mr. Chairman, if I can close on this, I know uh, a lot of us have conversations about whether or not net neutrality is good. I, I think if you look at the American people, uh, a bipartisan majority of Congress has said uh, that they don't want uh, this, this government intrusion and government takeover of the Internet. And so I would hope you all would go back and look at that because ultimately innovation Gentlemen. is the great equalizer. And, you know, when you look at today's college dropout can be tomorrow's billionaire, and, and the, the dropout of today is able to compete and in many cases beat Gentlemen. the big phone company or, or that other big company that's out there that, that you all seem to have Gentlemen. some concern about. So I would just Gentlemen's ask that you keep that in mind, and I would yield back the balance of my time, right, whatever that balance time. is. Thank you. I appreciate that. I seek unanimous consent and enter the record an editorial by David J. Farber, grandfather of the Internet, arguing the Internet neutrality rules are bad because everyone will game the regulations rather than innovate. We have a couple other documents that have been pre-cleared with the minority uh, to also enter those in the record without objection. I think the Pope trumps it myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd also say as a final closing comment, uh, at least speaking for some of us on this side of the aisle, the only entity more skeptical than, than our side of the aisle on these net neutrality rules may indeed be the D.C. Circuit Court. And finally, in conclusion, I'd like to thank all the witnesses and members that participated in today's hearing. I remind members they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record. I ask that the witnesses all agree to respond promptly to these questions, which I know you will. And with that, we do appreciate your counsel, your insight, and your hard work. And uh, this hearing stands adjourned. It's a three-day presidential weekend on American History TV on C-SPAN 3. Live from the Truman Little White House in Key West, what it's like to be related to an American president. We hear candid conversations with descendants of four U.S. presidents.